G'day guys, how are we? Welcome to Talking Boxing for another week. You have to forgive uh, my backdrop here, it's a little bit dodgy at the moment, but we'll uh, we'll get through it. Um, so it's Monday the 15th of August, you have to forgive me if I'm a little bit um, not as chirpy as normal. If you're a Carlton supporter, you'll understand where I'm coming from. It was a very, very tough weekend at the office. I know a lot of you guys out there probably don't um, know much about Aussie rules or you're in a state or overseas, whatever it might be, but tough weekend. We lost in the last 10 seconds after being in front by a point and uh, a very devastating um, weekend. But anyway, we uh, we move on. The show must go on. So if you haven't been here before, this is Talking Boxing. This is your show. We uh, we talk about what, what you want to talk about. I've got my own little agenda as well that we'll go through, but um, if you guys have got a comment or a question or whatever it might be, put it in the in the the uh, comment section. And uh, let's, as it says, let's talk some boxing. So we are on YouTube. We are on Facebook live at the moment. So uh, hopefully you can see me okay and hear me okay. Uh, we'll just see how we go. I'm just going to refresh everything here so I can see what's going on. For some reason, it doesn't give me the uh, the heads up when uh oh there it is so we've got our questions up there yep all right Stephen, how are you mate thanks for uh for tuning in great to have you along as i said we are on facebook on the deep dive boxing deep dive page and my own personal page so jump on i just have to go between all of them to see the comments coming up so as i said great to have you along what i'm going to do tonight we've got so as usual we've got all the aussie news all the world news plenty going on at the moment actually and then uh later on i'm going to go through my if we, if we get time uh, i'm going to go through my five favorite fights of all time now i'm not saying the five greatest fights i'm talking about my personal favorite fights uh, i've just got to make sure that we get it right because uh, i have sort of learned in the uh, last couple of weeks by doing a few of the um uh, different uh top tens and all the rest of it that if you don't get it right People will let you know about it. And I referred to a couple of weeks ago with the amateurs. Well, geez, I'd have caught that because I didn't go back to 1910 for who was the best amateur back in 1910. So I only comment on things I know about. I didn't know about the amateur scene back in 1910 or 20, whatever it might be. So apologies to all you that reached out there and said, what about such and such? He was the Australian lightweight amateur champion in 1922. It was of the modern era. So, uh, and as I said at the time, feel free to, to give me your your picks. It was really good. It was because uh, we had, uh, of course, Robbie Peden was number one. Uh, Justin Crawford was on there as well, amongst uh, you know a lot of others. And it was really good to get feedback from the guys themselves. Uh, Robbie Peden actually rang me the day after, and uh, we had a bit of a chat about. It. He was pretty chuffed that, in my little humble opinion, he's the best. And I think a lot of people out there would probably agree that uh, Bomber Peden would be the best, even though uh, I'm not sure. If you all watch the uh, the deep dive show on a Friday morning, it comes out. Tazzy did his uh, the week after I did mine, and a little bit different. He went right back, of course, in the history of, bo of uh, amateur boxing in his country, and you know, he uh, hit it out of the park. But as I said, I didn't go back that far, only back to the eighties because I don't comment thing comment on things I uh, I don't know much about. So as I said, guys, make sure that you put some comments and questions in there. Uh, I'm going to go through all the, as I said, the latest Aussie news, world news. Make sure you put a question or comment so we can we can interact. Uh, makes it so much better when uh, when you guys are throwing things at me uh, because it keeps the conversation going and uh, it makes it a hell of a lot more fun than me rambling on for an hour or whatever it might be. So let's get on to, firstly, the Aussie news. Paul Gallum, whether you love him or hate him, he is back. He's doing a, uh, what would you call it, a dual showdown on the night i'm not sure what you'd call it but end of the day he's fighting two opponents i'm going to bring up his uh the card here it's on the 15th of september unfortunately i won't be here so i'll miss it but we'll go through obviously the main events not the main event the main events and also who else is on the card looks pretty good look i'll be honest with you i'm probably upset a few people here i don't think it's worth 60 bucks i will say i did comment last week on the deep dive show that um look I'll based on the on the main events themselves. I will probably not buy it uh, by the card, even though as I said I'm going to be away, so it won't matter. However, normally they will put on a really good undercard, and uh, it's worth the sixty bucks. Um, and I'll go through the undercard in a second here. But I don't know what you guys uh, think, uh, Paul. Uh, what have we got here? Wondering if I'll get a mention on all my five, fifty minutes or more. You are the champ, Paul. Um, it, Paul. Uh, 
You're about the only one I know recently that over the weekend that actually had a good weekend, mate. The Tigers had a good win, uh, as I said at the start. I'm not talking football. Um, I don't know. It's just me. It always happens to Carlton. Actually, Paul, you, you probably hit, know where I'm coming from here. The only other team I can think of that shit, this shit happens to on a regular basis, the miracles that seem to happen against us, it's Richmond and Carlton. I don't know. Some clubs escape it, but... Not the Blues, unfortunately. I was there and I had to live through the last 10 seconds. We were in front. We are in the finals. A point to go. And what's his name? Little Pickett, Kickett, whatever his name. Pickett, I think his name is. Kicked the goal from nowhere. Barely sighted all night. And uh, sinks us. But anyway, this is a boxing show. And uh, we will talk some boxing. So thanks for tuning in, Paul. I'm going to keep checking the comments as we go there. Just so I don't miss any. I'm on three pages at once. Oh, yeah. So, Paul, you're on the deep dive page. Beauty, I can see you. So I think it's just my own personal page that I'm struggling to see, but I'll keep um, uh, logging on there. All right. What have we got here, mate? Uh, agree the head coach should work in more with the club coaches that probably know more about the boxer, not say that national coach can't bring an extra dimension, though. Yeah, thanks, Shane. I'm, I'm assuming that's uh, with the amateur um, side of things that we spoke about uh, last week or whatever it was. Uh, oh, thanks, mate. I uh, appreciate that comment. But, um, yeah, I'll take a deep breath before I get on the more Carlton stuff here. All you non-AFL players, uh, supporters, you don't know where I'm coming from here. It was a rough weekend. Okay. All right. Uh, so great to have you along, Shane. Thanks for the comment there, mate. Let's keep them coming. We'll keep uh, talking about as much as we can. Uh, but, yeah, I'm talking firstly about the Gallon card. Uh, now he's fighting. Uh, forgive me, guys. I don't know anything about rugby league. So I'm just going to assume that everyone else out there does. He's fighting Justin Hodges. I do know a little bit about Justin Hodges only because – uh, since he's been on the, the, the boxing circuit, he has actually had a bit of notoriety. Um, so he's five and one. I remember he got knocked out. I'm going to go back to uh, the one loss he had as the fight, one fight that I've seen. It was against Darcy Lusick. Now, he was stopped in one round. That was back in 2019. I thought it was only a year or so ago, but it's uh, two and a half years ago. It was stopped by Darcy Lusick on that card. Darcy Lusick, if you can remember, fought Paul Gallon after that and himself got cleaned up. And the guy... We're talking four two-minute rounds here, boys and girls, and was buggered after one round of a two-minute round fight, and Paul Gallen just, just had his way. That's why I struggle to take it seriously. And look, I'm all for people making money. So in this instance with Paul Gallen, I've got no issue with, with him, what he's doing here. I really haven't. Would I pay 60 bucks for it? Hell no. But what I'm trying to say is Paul Gallen, um, I've made no secret that I, I – look, I, I treat Paul Gallen – as a uh, a real boxer, he fights he fights real boxers. I mean, he's fought Lucas Brown, Justice Horney, to name a few. Um, uh, his last one, uh, what was his name? Chris uh, Tr Trowelski. Uh, I think I pronounced that right. So he's fighting real fighters for real titles, for real money over the whole length of a, of a proper fight. So I've got nothing but admiration for uh, for Paul Gallen. Now, and even in, in this instance, I've got no worries because. Look, he's made no secret. This is purely um, might be the last fight of his career or fights of his career. So make some money, go out on a high, and good luck to you. Uh, but as I said, would I pay 60 bucks for it? Hell no. Um, Shane, again, sorry I missed Tolford and Harry, but I'll save the 60 bucks for the Timmy Vegas. Hey, good call, Shane. Uh, exactly. Uh, 60 bucks. I'm, and look, I'm not trying to, to rubbish the card or, or, you know, force anyone to do it. What I'm saying is, is that, 60 bucks is a lot of money in this day and age. And again, I'll go through the card here. Now, so Gallon's fighting, I'll just go back here. He's fighting Justin Hodges, as I said then, and he's fighting Ben Hannett, who's zero and one. Now, I don't know about you, against Justin Hodges in his last fight, the highlights that I saw, I'm sorry, but he looked anything but a boxer. Now, if I was Paul Gallon, I'd probably fight him first because he's probably going to last one or two rounds, I would think. I would expect Paul Gallon to get him out of there, save him for Justin Hodges, or maybe... Don't risk any injury or cuts or whatever. Fight Justin Hodges first. Get it out the road and have a nice cruisy fight with Ben Hannett. The one thing that surprised me with from what I've seen of Justin Hodges, I saw the press conference. I know he's trying his best to talk it up and puff the chest out and try and do a bit of trash talking with Paul Gallon. Firstly, you never try and trash talk Paul Gallon because he's one of the masters at it in this country. And I, as again, I said, I don't, again, know much about the rugby league circuit, but I do know a lot about Paul Gallon now since he's been in the boxing uh, circuit. So, um, Got a lot of time for, for Paul, I must admit. Uh, this Paul, what's his name? Hang on, I'll get back to it. Uh, ben Hannett, 0-1 and, and looked anything but a fighter in his last fight, in my opinion. Um, but, yeah, so getting back to Justin Hodges. So he's saying he's going to knock Paul Gallon out and do this and do that. Mate, there's no way in hell. I would bet my house that he cannot knock Paul Gallon out. There's no way. Paul Gallon is 
I haven't seen a lot of him playing rugby, but I've, what I've seen him in, in the boxing, the guy's got a brick for a head, uh, loves dishing it out, can take a lot of punishment. So a lot of respect for Paul. There's no way in hell Justin Hodges is knocking Paul, Paul Gallon out. Uh, I'm not, I don't know whether he's trying to, again, just, just talk it up and um, create a bit more interest in it. But judging by what I've seen of him, he's not a big puncher. He's not very fit. He has got a good trainer, I will say. He's enlisted Steve Daller and Luke Molden up in uh, Fortitude. So he's got, it, he's got it right that way. But as far as having any hope against Paul Gallen, absolutely not. And Paul Gallen, I would assume, would absolutely ta- take him to the cleaners and uh, get both of them out of there within the distance. Um, all right, before we move on with the rest of the card, we've got a question from uh, Jai. How are you, Jai? Thanks for tuning in, mate. Does Triple G have to vacate his belts? If he loses to Canelo... Uh, other than retirement, what would prevent him from keeping his 160 belt? Uh, yeah, from what I've read, Jai, I don't think he will lose his belts uh, if he defends within a certain amount of time. If he decides to retire after Canelo, of course, he'll lose the belts. But from what I've, I've read and what I've gathered by the whole thing, if he loses to Canelo, as long as he defends those belts within a period afterwards, then he'll be fine. You got to remember, there's a different set of rules for the likes of Triple G and Canelo and Tyson Fury, which we'll get to soon. Those types of guys, they play by a different set of rules for those guys. So I would be staggered if they did strip them. I know we've had the talk here in Australia that Michael Zarafa will fight for the IBF belt. Uh, there's been other talk that uh, Mungia will fight uh, for uh, the WBA belt. I think it might have been or WBC belt. So lots of words going around. I look to be honest with the guy to answer your question. Who knows? But judged on what I've seen and what I've said in the past, I doubt they're going to strip Triple G. They'll give him an opportunity to fight one of the mandatories. Maybe one of the sanctioning bodies will, because at the end of the day, if he's got to defend those belts within six months, it's going to be pretty hard to defend it against, you know, you know it's a, an opponent that keeps everyone happy. So I would think that um, he would probably lose one of the belts just purely because he just can't get around to it. And he'll probably keep, obviously keep one, um, you know, one or two of the belts as well. So, but Having said that, after seeing what's happened in other cases, Canelo being one of them, I think all the sanctioning bottles will let Triple G just get over the fight and then make make a call. And if it doesn't suit their particular uh, sanctioning body, then they will strip them. And let's hope it's the IBF belt so that uh, Michael Zarafi gets his shot. I have heard on that front, though, on the Zarafi thing, that things are pretty much stalled there. Um, and if you follow Michael on social media, there's not a hell of a lot going. A lot of this is going to happen, this may happen, whatever, but... I think everyone's a little bit in limbo until after this fight to, to see what's going to happen. And, um, yeah, I have heard that Michael have had maybe some promotional issues and, and whatever else. So I'm not quite sure where that's at at the moment. All I know is they've gone very, very quiet on that front. So uh, let's hope that is the case that Michael gets a shot at the IBF belt. But as I said, I don't think they'll do anything until they get past his fight. And then it'll be up to Triple G. Look, if he gets beaten badly, I would think he's going to retire anyway. And actually, to be honest with you, I think even if he loses in general, I think he might retire. Why, why would he? I mean, he's 40 years old. This will be a great payday for him. Um, depends on how he loses, of course. But, you know. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, Andy, I think it is there. What have we got there? Hello, fans. And in the chat, Gallon appeals to the casuals that fold him across from NRL, in my opinion, but I do give him some cred. Yeah, as I said, mate, I give him a lot of cred for fighting real fighters over proper rounds for real titles. So um, so full credit to Gallon. And as I said, I don't blame him at all for taking this, what would you call it, circus event? to make some money. Um, the NRL guys will eat it up. As I said, I'm not a rugby league guy. I don't know much about it, but all I know is they do tend to love these type of events. So I'm sure they're going to get on. I did say on the deep dive show last week, and I want your opinion on it, whether you agree, um, that the whole thing about Gallon saying, and, and no limit to that extent, saying that, you know, we put the Gallons of the of the world on as the main event. We put the Harry Garsides and all these guys on the undercard uh, and we give them exposure and all this sort of stuff. I, I strongly disagree. Um, I think that all it does is the NRL guys will jump on uh, half an hour before the, the Gallon fight. Um, and even if they log on or tune in for the whole show, all these guys will be very, very quickly forgotten. So I don't subscribe to the whole put Gallon on or put whoever on, run one of these rugby guys on, and all the young guys get exposure. What The only thing they will get is a, an opportunity to maybe fight a very good fighter that um, that benefits their career with the money that's been generated by it. But as far as actually eyeballs on the event, watching those young fighters, I just don't think so. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but that's just my opinion. I think when they get them on, as I said, like in this fight here, they'll, they'll sell a lot of pay-per-views, which allows... Um, 
the Harry Gar side Zaliski fight to maybe happen. Not that that's a massive fight, I will say, but you will see I think the last card uh, when they had Sam Goodman fight the young uh, Japanese guy. That was probably made possible by Gallen being in the main, in the main event, and that was a good fight with uh, Trowski or whatever his name is. That was a that was a ripper. Um, the whole card was good in the Kita Zorn as well. I was I was happy to pay the sixty bucks for that for that, but. In here, I'm not quite sure. Before we get on to the car, we'll keep the questions coming. Keep them, um, yeah, keep them coming, guys, because I want to keep uh, answering your questions. This is your show, uh, and I'll fill in the gaps with uh, the Gallon and um, Hodges card in a sec. Uh, uh, Canelo didn't have to vacate the super middleweight, but for Bivol at light heavyweight, so expect Triple G holds and less strip. Yeah, as I said, mate, I, I don't think the um, the sanctioning bodies will just say, all right, you're lost, so we're going to strip you. They'll do what they've done to Canelo and say, all right, where are you at? Okay, we're going to give you six months to decide or to have a fight locked in or else we're going to strip you or it might be in conjunction with the other sanctioning body that he's got and we come up with a common opponent. So you don't know what the sanctioning bodies are going to do, to be honest. Uh, um, so who knows? But uh, I think when it comes to Triple G, he is in, in the uh, the goal class, so I would think that uh, he will get the benefit of the doubt and um, be given ample time to make a to make a decision. Um, what do we got here? Yeah, I'm with you, Lyndon. Likely Triple G retires if he loses, especially if uh, if stopped. Um, yeah, retirement dollars. What do you guys think with the result? I know we're only, what are we, three and a half, four weeks away, whatever it is. Um, I'm, I'm excited by it. I think um, I've said this before. I'm, I'm going over to the fight, so I'll cover it there. Um, hopefully provide plenty of content for you guys while while I'm over there. But I'm actually looking forward to it. So I think this could be the best of the three. Now, they've, all, they've all been, or they've both been ripper fights so far. The first one was great. More probably, um, probably a little bit more hand-to-hand, -hand, I suppose, or head-to-head. -head. The second fight, I thought Canelo was a bit more you know, uh, more creative, more boxing, whatever you might want to call it, um, and got the job done. But I've just got a feeling here, with four years have passed, Triple G probably knows he's not going to win a decision. Um, I think he's going to go for it. Well, he always does anyway. I think he's going to go for Canelo. And I've got a feeling Canelo is going to stand there and go with him. I think he wants to stop Triple G. I don't think outboxing Canelo, um, out tri boxing Triple G over 12 rounds is going to cut up this time. Um, so I, I think we could have a 12-round war here or however long it goes. I'm of the opinion that Canelo stops Triple G this time uh, in about eight or nine rounds or maybe even six or seven rounds. But I think he gets a job done this time. I think Canelo has a point to prove. I think going back to super middleweight really suits him. I really don't like him at light heavyweight. Um, he just doesn't throw the same amount of punches. Obviously, he's, the, one, the punches that he does throw doesn't have the same effect on the bigger guys. Uh, he doesn't seem to have the tank um, that he does at the, at the lighter weight as well. And he's just coming up against big guys. And I just take my hat off to Canelo for doing it. I don't think he loses for me any credibility whatsoever, um, you know, by losing to Bivol. And I think if he beats Triple G, I think it'll be very quickly uh, forgotten anyway. Um, Stephen, just getting back to the, um, uh, the Gallon thing, Justin... Uh, is gone inside the first minute. I don't think it'll be the first minute, mate, but I think I think it could be very close. I'm thinking probably second or third round. I think he gets him out of there. I think Hannon might be two rounds, um, but good luck to him. Uh, Paul stops him in the first uh, round. Yeah, could be. Paul Arava, we all just laughing there, so thanks, mate. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so we'll keep him coming there. I'll keep an eye on it there. Um, all right, so, yeah, on the rest of the card, guys, the main support, Harry Gar side up against Miles Zaluski. Uh, Harry's 3-0 against Miles Zaluski. He's 11-2, coming off a pretty good knockout in the last fight against Shivers, uh, Mis Shivers Misra. Hang on, I'll just pronounce that right. Um, how do you pronounce it? Shiva, Shiva Misra is how you pronounce it. So he got a good win over that. The guy can punch. I like him because he's exciting. He really likes to um, to throw down, and I think it's going to be a really good fight. Does Harry win? Yes, of course he, he does. I don't think he would um, be uh, taking this fight, or his management team would be taking this fight if they didn't think he would win. But I think it's a I think it's a great fight, a really really good, tough, e even fight for Harry. Now, <clears throat> again, I said this on the deep dive show last last week, so make sure you watch it on a Friday morning. That um, you know the fact that Harry's had three fights. Um, compared to uh, Zalewski, who's had 13 fights. I don't really take much into that because Harry's had a lot of amateur fights. I, I don't know the exact amount, but wouldn't be surprised if it was 150 plus, I don't think. So um, what do we got there? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think um, it makes any difference. I think Harry, look, he's shown in the last fight. He went a really, actually, that was a stoppage over late McFerrin. Before that, the 10 rounds against um, Manuel Matei. 
fought 10 rounds at a really, really good pace. So I think um, I don't think that will worry me either. But I'm really looking forward to that fight. Is it worth $60? Hell no. But I'll be watching it at the replay the next day. Um, what have we got here? I will pay for third. Uh, Triple G deserve first. Canelo second, while third seals the deal. Yep, I'm expecting 12 rounds. Triple G will be good at more natural weight. Yeah, it'd be, yes, you're right, Tom. It'd be interesting to see how he goes at super middleweight, whether it actually hinders him or helps him. So I, I don't think he makes middleweight super easy, but he doesn't struggle with that makes sense. So I think, yeah, I think he'll be he'll be okay at the weight. I mean, he's obviously he hasn't fought at that weight before, so it's a bit of an unknown. But I, I don't think it'll harm him too too bad. I think. I think it'll be it'll be really strong at the weight. Canelo, we know, is obviously strong at that weight, but I really think the third fight might be the best of them all. I really do. Sometimes you get fighters that have been or at the last the latter stage of their careers, and maybe you've only got one or two big fights left left in them. You know, against Canelo, who's not at his peak either. I think he's slightly past his peak now. Um, you know, sometimes they present the best fights. So we'll see what happens. Uh, what do we got? Um, Paro, job us update this week. Yes, yes. Uh, I've got a couple of friends in the know with this one, Jai, and um, any day they'll drop some big news. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be the fact that it's been it's been pencilled in for the night before Cambosis and Haney too. That seems to be the word that I'm hearing from multiple sources. So um, I, I'm not quite sure. It obviously can't be free because the, the guys are on too much money for it to be free on uh, on Fox, I would think. So I'm a little bit worried they're going to put it on pay-per-view if it's the week, um, the night or two nights before Haney Cambosis. I don't know. Um, would you guys pay $60 times two? It'd be easy to say, yes, I want to pay, but it's a lot of money, 120 bucks over a weekend to, to spend on fights. So I um, don't know. But yeah, it should be, mate. So I'm assuming it's going to be the, uh, the, uh, the 15th of October. Um, and they'll announce that officially. So, um, uh, so we'll see, mate. But yeah, any any day now we'll get the update. What else have we got? Triple G, probably my top one or two favourites over the last decade. Keen for the fight, but thought he looked a little, little vulnerable in the early rounds of Japan. Well, Shane, mate, I thought after four rounds, I thought that was curtains for Triple G. And I'm not a I'm not a big rap for um, Murata. I think he's he's a good solid fighter, but certainly nothing special. Um, and I was really hoping that uh, either Horn, Zarafa, or even Timmy Zhu had got hold of uh, Murata. I think they would have made light work of him, to be honest. But look, Triple G looked like he was underwater for four rounds. He really did. And, um, you know, uh, he looked in trouble. He was backing up. Um, he just didn't look just didn't look there. And Murata, you know, he, he, he tended, he, I think he sort of tanked out a little bit or gassed out and allowed Triple G to sort of take center ring back off him. And then he was able to chop him down. But Look, that would have been tough on, on Triple G. He hadn't fought for a long time. It was obviously in Japan. Um, you know, it would have been tough to get up for that fight. So that's why I'm not sort of basing everything on that fight. I think we get sort of sucked in a little bit by, you know, someone like a you know a top-line fighter like Triple G when they have to go back a couple of cogs to fight. But they really struggle to get up for it. Canelo, that won't be the, the, the case. I think he's going to really come to fight, and I think um, it should be um, uh, a ripper. Uh, if Canelo stops Triple G, I expect it via body shot. Yeah, that's a good point, mate, because one thing that uh, has seemed to be Triple G's kryptonite is the body. And he actually got hurt against Murata as well. And I think, like a lot of fighters this day and age, they tend to forget that fighters actually have a body, I mean, especially the ones that can take a shot to the head. They'll hit them with, all night with a crowbar and they won't go down. Sometimes you hit them to the body and that's all it takes. And Triple G was hurt. So I'm with you. I wouldn't be surprised if Canelo really starts to go to the body early and, and tries to chop him down. You don't often see fighters of the magnitude of Triple G get chopped down by body punches, but you never know. And uh, as I said, Murata did hurt him. So I'm with you. I think um, Canelo, if he's smart, will be studying those tapes and and uh, will be going for the body. Maybe the, the Triple G camp will know that's going to happen, so they'll plan for it as well. Who knows? But as I said, I just think it's going to be, going to be a, uh, a ripper. Uh, what have we got here? Like and sub. Yes, like and subscribe, please, folks. Um, we're slowly improving each week. Um, look, it's funny with um, social media and YouTube and all the rest of it. You tend to, when you start a channel, you tend to go bang and everyone jumps on and it's all, you know, the rage. Everyone's liking, sharing, subscribing. And all of a sudden you get to a point and it just, then it just stops. Then you've got to work really hard to get there. So look, end of the day, guys, I'm not that stressed about um, all the folds. It's great to um, to have you guys, and it's very, very much appreciated. But uh, I'd rather have a smaller base that really appreciates what we do and we can interact with rather than a big base that pretty much likes us for the hell of it. So for you guys that are liking, subscribing to our page, very, very much appreciated. And really, um, uh, it's great that you guys are coming on and, and interacting here. This is what it's all about. Um, 
and Shane. So you agree with uh, what Shane said? Yep, that's good. What do we got here? Uh, another. I'll put, forgive me if I've got this wrong here. Sig, Zygmunt Krasniski, 88. So uh, apologies if I've got that wrong. Uh, hi, Lyndon. We've got Jarvis and Paro coming up soon. I think it's quite remarkable that at Brock's height and frame, he started his career at Super Bantam. What's your opinion on weight cutting in general? Okay. Well, I've had a lot of a lot of things to say about the weight cutting um, Zygmunt, I'll call you. Um, my view, especially in novice fighters and and juniors or no, um, juniors or kids or whatever it might be, I'm totally against weight cutting at all. Yeah, maybe a kilo, maybe two if it's not much of a drama. Totally against weight cutting for those types of fighters, kids and novices. They should be more concentrating on learning the sport. Um, I'd much rather that, you know, that time they spend worrying about cutting weight and all the extra sessions they've got to do cutting weight. I'd rather that in the gym with their coach, practicing how to slip a punch or block a punch or throw a hook properly, whatever it might be, especially kids. They should be in the gym. I, I train a, um, a young kid and um, it's not about, um, you know, even conditioning and about the weight. It's about fighting at a natural weight. And at the moment, let's just worry about, getting the skills right. And yes, as I said, if you've got to lose a kilo or two, if it needs to be done, then do it. But I'm totally against it. And I've seen firsthand fighters that have only been, I've seen literally guys having in the first fight who spent all the time worrying about weight and stripping off multiple kilos um, to get in there to try and boil it, put themselves down. At that, it shouldn't, at novice level or kids level, it doesn't matter. And if you lose a fight, whatever, at least if you're big and strong and your natural weight, at least you're going to, um, if you lose the fight, you know, it's going to be on, on the merits, not by being um, boiled down. I've actually, a good friend of mine was actually boiled down. He, he lost literally 10 kilos uh, for his first fight. And no surprise that he got knocked out in the first round because he spent all his time worrying about cutting weight and uh, getting down 10 kilos. He should have just, my argument, I argued with him about it. Maybe lose three or four because he was a little bit of a heavier set sort of guy. Lose three or four, but not ten. That's ridiculous. It really is. And no, no surprise, the first good shot he got hit with, he had no strength. He was he was out. And the thing is, this is an amateur fight, so it's not like the pros where you got you get twenty four hours to recover. This is literally two hours before he fought, so he had no hope. Poor bloke almost had to be carried into the ring. It was disgusting. So I am totally against it. So I hope that answers your question. I'll get the Jarv Jarvis and Paro in a sec, but yeah, in general, my my weight cutting thing is. Juniors and novices, absolutely not, unless it's one or two kilos. Focus on the skills and learning the sport. And then when there's titles on the line, maybe do it. That a little bit different when you get to elite level. But even that, I think these days, again, like at elite, at elite level, these guys can bang, you know, and no matter what weight they're at. So why, you know, the, the weights are pretty close together these days, or they've always been. You know, you're looking at four pounds, five pounds, two kilos. You know, to starve yourself and get yourself down, and boiling, cutting weight, I just don't, I don't understand it. But um, not to say I didn't do it in my time. That's probably why I'm so, so much against it. Should have probably went up and spent that time. But anyway, that's on the weight cutting on Jarvis and Paro. Yeah, well, Brock's interesting because I actually promoted him in 2017. It was now he he weighed in at Super Bantam for that uh, for that fight. He started at Bantamweight. Might have even been Super Flyweight if you can believe it. Super Flyweight is 48 kilos. So get get your head around that. Now, he fought at 55, I think it was, uh, when he fought on my card, and he's going to be fighting at 63 and a half or 64, whatever it might be. Mate, this guy could fight, i got no doubt, at junior middleweight. That's the sort of frame he's got. He's just got – he's very, very tall. I think he'd be 5'10", I think, I'm thinking 5'11", even. I'm not quite sure, but I know he's a lot taller than what I am, and I'm 5'8". Um, and he's got that frame. He's got the Tommy Hearns frame or De La Hoya frame, where they're a little bit taller for, for what they normally fight at, and they've got that frame to put on the weight uh, and, and comfortably. Not like us little short fellas who put on a couple of kilos and you can sort of feel it and see it. Those guys can carry it, no problem. I don't know about you guys think. Well, from what I've seen him in late, um, seen of him lately, but the guy's a monster. He looks like a middleweight at the moment. He is massive. And uh, I remember having a conversation with uh, Jeff Fennick. Uh, I think I might have said this before talking about it, but when when Jeff and Brock were on the car, I remember having a, a talk to Jeff, and he, I remember him saying, even though what's that five years ago, him saying, uh, we're not really stressed about, um, you know, um, you know, bulk him up too early. We want to just get the fights in and progress him normally. I've got a feeling they've got him to the, was he 23, 24 four fights, whatever it might be. And I think Jeff's just said, hey, look, you know, forget all this trying to ball down. Let's just put the weight on and fight at whatever we feel comfortable at. 
And um, I wouldn't be surprised again if, I, as I said, if we saw him at welterweight or light middleweight going forward. But for this one, I think you'll find that he'll be the bigger guy. I can't believe I'm saying that. I think he will be the bigger guy over Liam Paro. Um, but yeah, so a bit answer your question there, mate. I've got no dramas with it with his height and frame. He will carry the weight, no problems. I think, if anything, it'll make him even big. Well, he's going to be bigger, of course, but I think stronger because he won't be cutting weight. He'll be, he'll be doing a lot of strength work with Jeff. And uh, if you've seen him fight at the lower weights, he's, he's a beast. If he gets close and you allow him to put his head on your chest and rip and hook to the head and body and keep you on the ropes, you're in all sorts of trouble. So I think the strategy from Liam Paro will to box him at long range, don't get caught on the ropes, pivot off or, or kick around to the side and don't get caught on the ropes because if he does... Um, I think that's the way that um, Brock wins the fight because he fights just like Jeff Jeff did. He'll pin you on the ropes. He will not let you out, and he'll keep punching until you stop or the referee calls it off. So uh, I think the strategy from Liam will be and, – and Liam's a very, very slick fighter. Um, I've got a lot of time for Liam Paro, so, and I think he wins the fight if he does that. So he'll be – he'll be. I think he'll try and keep Brock at long range, use the long range punches. He's southpaw too, remember. He likes to throw really sharp uh, punches, so I think he'll punch – um, he'll try and step off to the side or pivot off to the side from when Brock tries to get close. And I think if he does that, I think he'll be able to keep uh, Brock at a distance and uh, and win a decision. Can't wait for the fight, though. I'm looking forward to that more than uh, Cambosis and Haney, to be honest, if I must say. Uh, so let me know what you guys think. More on the weight. Uh, I prefer natural weight. Mundine was crazy doing what he did. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> I'm still leaning to Paro, but props to Brock if he proves me wrong. Now, on the Mundine thing, again, we've talked about this on shows past. Anthony Mundine at light heavyweight was just was just brilliant. And you know? even at his very, very early stages of his career, when he was practically a novice, he just looked so much better. You know, he, he just looked strong. He looked hard. He could punch at that weight as well. There's a lot of guys out at that weight. And when he went down in weight, not only did he lose his strength, he lost his power, and he also lost the ability to actually take punishment. Have you seen his later fights? I think it was... Um, Hadley, was it? Um, and uh, Clotty. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think, obviously, against Serafa and Horn or those types of guys. But he got dropped multiple times in those fights. He just didn't have the strength. And even though he had that time to recover, he looked weak. Um, he just didn't, you know, it was a real shame because he should have done what, um, say, a Mundine, uh, Mundine uh, Mayweather or uh, Pacquiao or even like a um, Canelo. They've all gone up at a really good comfortable weight they factor their, their skills and their experience to be able to carry a little bit of extra weight so they're not having to worry about the, that at their at their advanced ages Mundine's pushing 40 and he's and he's going down to 50 uh sorry 154 which is 70 kilos uh, and the guy used to fight at 76 77 kilos and he's gone down to 70 so he's dropped 18 uh sorry 14 pounds 14 or 15 pounds that's a lot of weight to drop so um especially when they're that age. So I think it was absolutely crazy. I think he missed out on probably those last really good last couple of years of his career. Um, I know he did fight uh, and beat the Russian, I think, and that was probably his last um, big win, I think it was. And after that, he was just cannon fodder for the young guys coming up. So it's a bit of a shame. Uh, I've got so much time for Anthony Mundine. Forget what you think of him as a person, as a fighter, one of the most gifted fighters this country has ever produced. Um, so that's what I think of, uh, of him. Uh, still leaning to Paro, but props to Brock if he proves me wrong. Yeah, as I said, mate, I'm with you. Uh, I'm leaning towards Paro. I'm, I'm not going for either fighter, by the way. Um, Paro, I've got a lot of time for. I met him a couple of times. Really, really good young guy. Uh, really, really good team behind him in the, the Carlos. Um, and Brock, of course. I mean, we all love uh, uh, Jeff. But Brock himself, such a lovely young guy. Got a lot of time for Brock. A real gentleman. And um, as I said, I'm not going for either one. I'm just going to sit down as a neutral fan and watch it and enjoy it and uh, really take it all in. Um, what do we got there? Just hoping I'm getting all your comments here, guys. I'll just double check the pages here. Uh, Paul Haraba, what's your thoughts about Tio? Has he been hit in the head too many times to be so delusional? And his dad, what's his deal? Um, yeah, geez, he is delusional, isn't he? His dad, oh my god. Oh, look, he looked okay in the week. I was going to get to that in the, in the international part. I'd rather talk with you guys like we are than go over all that sort of stuff. So keep the questions coming. Oh, look, he looked okay. I don't think he looked like a world beater, to be honest, on the weekend, Tiafimo. But look, end of the day, he's been out for how long? Um, nine months or whatever it's been, eight or nine months. So I think this is a case of just just get the win, get it out the road, 
go up in weight. Um, they obviously picked an opponent that wasn't really a big puncher, not not an opponent that could really cause any damage. He was just in there to get the rounds in. So and that's what happens in these fights. I, I take nothing away from his team or his promoters or whatever it might be for, for putting that guy in with him, uh, Pedro Camper. Um, but, yeah, look, I think he looked okay. But I think it was, as I said, it was purely more of a just come back, get a few rounds in, feel comfortable at 140, just do your thing, and then we'll worry about looking good next time. But his dad, I mean, the guy's delusional. He really is. And I, I'm not a fan of father's training and managing and whatever else with the sons. I'm really not. I just don't think it ends well. I think they're blind to the flaws that they might have, if especially if they're training the guys. They're, they're oblivious to what, what things they need to, to work on. And all you got to do is look at um, Tia Fimo's fight with George. Um, George was clearly winning the fight, but his dad kept telling him he was winning the rounds. And afterwards... You know, maybe that's why T. Female was so delusional after the fight and actually thought that he won the fight. I mean, how I don't know how you could possibly think um, anyone involved with him that he won that fight. But anyway, we've been over that a hundred times. But I would like to see, and I thought that might have been a catalyst for it, to be honest, where they might have sat down. He might have said to his dad, hey, look, Dad, I love you. I need a fresh set of eyes. I need someone that's neutral. And I need someone that's actually a proper big-time trainer. I think these dads, I just tend to forget. Uh, and, and look... Probably to some to a lesser extent, Danny Garcia's dad's a little bit the same. Although I don't think Danny Garcia's dad's a bad trainer, not the best, but he, I think he's a lot better than Lopez's trainer. Put it that way. Um, but we've seen it with um, Guerrero, Robert Guerrero, and, and a few others. But um, the exception probably being Mundine, Anthony Mundine, with his dad Tony. I thought Tony did a great job uh, training him. But yeah, look, I, I don't know. I, I, as I said, I'm not a fan of it. I just think they should have they should have maybe kept him as a manager if that's what you want to do. Uh, maybe have him as a, well, I was going to say have him as a corner, but that wouldn't work either because then he would be in you know, the trainer's face. So I would say cut him loose, stay out there, be my, my number one guy and support me, but maybe leave the training up to um, up to an expert. Because to you, Femme Lopez, I just think how much better he could be if he had a, a Freddie Roach or a Robert Garcia or one of those guys in his corner. I mean, he's, he's a very, very good fighter, but I just think they're a bit delusional about where he's, he's at. Um, what have we got here? Um, what do we got? So Shane, yeah, big across his shoulders and across his back. Yep, mate. And one, two, then pivot off. Yeah, that's the way Paro's going to win it, mate. One, two, pivot off. Yep, fight him a little bit like Pacquiao fought those, those real good Mexican sluggers. One, two, pivot off to the side. That's all he did the whole time. And I think if, with all all Brock's um, strengths, one um, thing I, I probably, one fold I would probably put on him, he doesn't cut the ring down that well. He likes to hunt you down and pin you there. But when you get someone on the bike, he tends to maybe not cut them off. I'm sure that's what they're working on as well. I think knowing, knowing Jeff, he would be working on all these tangibles about, you know, if pa Paro's uh, going to fight him like this, we have to be prepared. We're not, he's not going to lie on the ropes and let him lean on us and bang away. I think he knows that. So I think that he should be working on cutting off the ring and uh, making the ring a lot smaller. Um, and, and you can do that quite easily. If you take center ring and a little pivot to the left or a little step off to the right, you can actually keep someone like a Paro within your punching range or where you want them. If he allows allows Paro to dictate from the outside of the ring and pinpoint him with those one twos and whatever, um, I think it's going to be a very comfortable night for Paro. So as I said, I've got no allegiance to either guys. I like them both. I'm just can't wait for a really, really top night of boxing. And I would pay a hundred bucks for the for the uh for the fight between you guys. Um on Tiafimo still. Uh, decent return for T.O. Jr. to get the W, but Dad's still trying to take a lot. Oh, it, again, what is it with these dads? Um, and I did have my say on even George with his dad um, as well. Uh, after you know about uh, with the, I've got to be careful. I won't say too much, but in the lead up to the the Haney fight, um, pretty much trying to have the face off, and all you see is his dad's head. You know, right there. Yeah, may as well may as well have been him facing off with Haney, you know, but um trying to get in there. Uh, and I think a comment of it just step back and let them have the time. Um but it's dads. We you know, all the dads out there, we love our sons. I must admit, if I I've got two sons, if they were um boxers, which luckily they're not, I would step away and make sure they get a very, very good trainer and a good manager, and then I would step back and let them have a say. I would have some input outside the ring. But as far as having input in there, and you're right with type taking the limelight off it. I mean, come on, step back, mate. Get out of there. Let him have this. Let him have the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a laugh. But surely the the, the fighters themselves are going to sit back and go, Dad, get your head out of there, will you? 
<laughs> and this is spot on. Dad's living too much through Psalms. Yes, a lot of these guys um, are living their dreams through their Psalms. It happens in all sports, footy being another one, you know, um, living their dreams through the Psalms. They've all, they're all boxing fans. They've got sons, so they push them in there and they become almost like the soccer mums, I, I, I suppose you call it. But these are boxing dads and they live their life through them. They, they love it. Uh, they, they get off on it. Um, but I think it's to the detriment of their sons. I really do. Uh, I just I just don't I'm, don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. Uh, as I said, be part of the, the team, if it's management or advice or whatever you might want to call it, stay out of it as far as, as, far as the training team and just let the boys, uh, the sons or daughters for that for that matter, have their um, the time and just take a little bit of the heat off them as well. Uh, Shane again. My son and I had to have a serious conversation about me stepping back to only pad work at home and me keeping my mouth shut before and after sparring. It must be hard, mate. It must be hard. Um, yeah, as I said, my, my two sons, uh, they, they, they both have done boxing, but uh, just with me on the pads and that sort of stuff, but I've shown no desire to be in the ring, which I'm pretty happy about, to be honest. But in your case, your, your, um, your son actually wants to be a boxer. Yeah, I don't envy you, mate, but... Look, I think it's just easier on, on everyone, including you. I mean, when you're in in the ring, let's face it: if you've got your fight, your, your son in there fighting, the emotions can really get get um, you know you can take over, and, and you lose sight of what you're actually in there to do about sticking to the plan um, and just seeing it through, um, you know, uh, calm eyes, I suppose. Because uh, I must admit, if I was, if my son's in there punching on it, I can't imagine myself being nice, cool, calm, and collected in the corner and telling him the way it is. It'd be I mean, you know, I probably want to go across and slap the other guy, to be honest. But uh, I don't envy you, mate. But I, I think what you've done there is spot on. I think do pad work with them at home, offer some advice, uh, but let them get a good, um, you know, uh, you know proper, a proper training. You know what I mean? Like some, uh, someone else to take them on and go through all that with them, um, you know, when they're actually in the ring. And let you go back to ringside and enjoy it from the um, from the from your ringside seat. Um, what else we got there, guys? Thanks for, for these comments too, guys. Very much appreciate it. Keep the show rolling on just nicely. Yeah, he, he's Tia Senior, Tia Senior, the worst. <laughs> Look, I reckon, um, I reckon for me, Robert Guerrero's dad is still the worst. He was a peanut, that guy. And uh, well, I think when he did he fight Danny Garcia, I remember the two dads. It was like this. It, it was just like, oh my god, and they took. The whole attention away from the, their sons, and even the sons, I'm sure, at some stage, looking at each other going, geez, about, you know, you would have Garcia and Guerrero, Guerrero, the fighters, saying, hey, let's just go and have a coffee and let these guys duke it out while we go and, um, you know, have a coffee and talk about boxing. It was just ridiculous. But anyway, all right, guys, let's keep going through the card. Keep the comments coming there. I'll, I'll keep going back to them. The rest of the card, who we got? We got Benjamin Hussain against Lockie Higgins in an eight round. Uh, looks like it's a. Uh, middleweight fight for the IBO Oceana Orient title. Again, I, I lose track of all these titles. The IBO Oceana Orient. Um, I don't even know what that means, but that's what the fight the fight is the the fighting for. I think it would either be in the Oceana or you'd be in the Orient. I'm not sure how you can do a crossover. But anyway, uh, the other card, this one actually looks entertaining. Joseph Goodall against Arsene Fozzo. Uh, you would have seen Fozzo against Hoodie. Gave him a really good fight, I thought. I thought it was probably stopped a little bit prematurely, that one. I think that's a really good fight. And I think Fozzo takes it right up to Goodall. You would expect Goodall to win, but, um, yeah, that's that's a good fight. Jack Bowen's on the card. I've got so much time for Jack Bowen. He is a gun. Uh, and I really like the way they've progressed him through. 7-0, and he's, he's managed by a uh, good mate, uh, Mike Altamura, of course, one of the best in the business, is Mike. So he manages him, so I'm sure they'll take him on at the right pace and uh, get him the right fights. Doesn't say who was fighting here, but it'll be a six rounder. Ty Telford against um, oh, it's one word. What is it? Van Lalawapua. I won't try and pronounce that again. We'll just leave it at that. Four zero and one. So uh, Ty Telford, I love him as a fighter. Seven one and one. He's the man. Ty Telford just comes to fight. You know, doesn't care who it is. Um, I loved his fight. Um, against was it Dara Foley? Uh, it was just an absolute war. His last fight, I think it was against, um, was it uh, the young guy from Queensland? Hang on, I'll just quickly look it up. Tyson Best, who was a tough fighter in himself, uh, so he knocked him out in two, which I thought was surprising. But a little, got a lot of time for Ty Telford. Also on the card, uh, Jalen Tate, eight and no against Krishni Madulia, nine and six. Angel Rushton, the daughter of Glenn Rushton, 2-0 against Ange Harris, who's making her debut. Desley Robinson, 2-0 against Stephanie 
Uh, Fong Wat, one and one over five twos. Uh, the Russian fight was five twos as well. And then, of course, the Gallon fight. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure, again, would I pay uh, for the 60 bucks for that. I'm not sure whether you guys would, but I wouldn't at all, to be honest. Shane with another question there. I'm just going to get this back up there. Uh, where are we? So I'm getting a little bit dark there. Where are we? That's a little bit better. All right. So trying to feel holiday. No, no deal. To be fair, not much more. I can. Add, oh, mate. Well, there you go. You can't get much better than Philip Holiday, gun fighter, gun trainer. Love him as a referee as well. So, mate, he's in very, very good hands there. So, um, you've done very well there, mate. So, I'm sure uh, he'll be fine. And good luck to him uh, in his career as well. Um, Telford, great fight. Yeah, I mean, these are the fighters you love to pay and see. Again, I'm not – this guy, if it had been – I would love to see him against Stevie Spark. That's a fight that I would love, love to see. Or um, who's the other welterweight that uh, Spark beat? Um, Jack Brubaker would be another one as well. So some really good fights out there. Um, but he's already fought Dara Foley. I thought he was a little bit unlucky in that fight, I must admit. But I'd love to see him in there with uh, Stevie Spark. I reckon that would be an absolute war. But I think from what I've seen with Stevie Spark, he's about to go to the international level. And uh, um, I can't remember where I saw it the other day. I haven't checked it for a couple of days. But he is fighting. Um, I think he's been offered a fight overseas. And forgive me, correct me if I'm wrong, put it in the, the uh, comments there. I can't remember who it is, but it's an international fight against a pretty good guy. Uh, so I'll keep checking the comments there. All right, so on to some more news. Sam, uh, sorry, Dennis Hogan, Sam Eggington. What do you think about that? That'll be a really good fight as well. Um, I'm not sure. See, Dennis Hogan's his fourth crack at the world title. Now, I, I must admit I thought he was finished when he fought Tim Zoo, and I'm not quite sure what he's done since then to earn a world title shot. Um, the IBO, look, you take these fights uh, for what it is and you use them to springboard to other big fights. Um, do I do I think it's a proper world title fight? I'm sorry, no. Um, I'm sorry, I just don't see the IBO as a recognised body. Um, I think the IBO takes this fight. I know before you start, I know Usyk and Triple G have held IBO titles all the rest of it, uh, but they've also held proper world titles as well. They sort of use the IBO as, as a bit of a leverage for that as well. So look, if this maybe gets Dennis, if he wins this fight, the IBO title gets him a shot at a real title, well, that's great, but I'm not going to be calling it a proper world title um, well, it's at IBO, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's great he's got the fight. He's really reinvented his career, so good luck to him. Um, so that's going to be in Brisbane. Good on No Limit again for getting the fight here, but um, do I think it's a real world title fight? No, but as I said, if it springboards him to, a, to another bigger fight, then even better. Wouldn't it be good to see Dennis Hogan fight a Michael Zarafa or an Isaac Hardman or one of these guys? Um, probably not going to happen because Zarafa's not going to risk his world rating or whatever it might be, but... If things stall with the Triple G thing, geez, him and Dennis Hogan would be uh, a ripper. I know, is it the, this is junior middle, but he's fought at middleweight before, so I think it could happen. But anyway, that could be that could be a good one. So good on Dennis for, for that fight, um, and good luck to him. I really like the top Australian amateur boxers, top 10. Thanks, mate, this uh, this week in your career, Lyndon. Who was your hardest fight, and who was any reason you didn't turn pro? Uh, thanks, thanks for, uh, firstly, for the top 10 amateur, mate. Um, I've got a fair bit of feedback. Um, to be to be fair, everyone seems to be an expert, and I'm happy to take. Um, I won't say criticism. I'll be happy to take people's feedback, but I don't know in this day and age what it's like. But if you put up something that people don't agree with, all of a sudden it gets a bit nasty. I mean, I'm in my opinion, if someone doesn't, if I don't agree with someone, I'll say I respectfully disagree, and this is why. This whole you don't know shit about boxing and this and that. I mean, I think I said on the deep dive show last week, one of our dream fights. I think it was Salvador Sanchez and. Marco Antonio Barrera. Now, we all went for Sanchez for starters, but someone put on our YouTube page that we didn't know shit. How can we even put it up as a dream fight? I thought it was a good dream fight, to be honest, even though we all went for Sanchez and 40% of the, the people out there thought so as well. But some guy, you don't know shit about boxing and garbage pick and all the rest of it. You can respectfully disagree. And in this case, just to get back to that, mate, yeah, I had a few uh, off air as well, um, phone calls and messages and that sort of stuff. But it was very, it was good bands, I must say. There's a lot of other guys that I know that, um, that that wanted to put up their top 10. So I really enjoyed it, mate, because you probably you probably don't see it that often. And um, and I've been, been wanting to do it for, for quite some time. And the reason I didn't do it, because I thought, oh, do I really want to have the feedback of people out there that, you know, want to have a crack? I mean, I did cop it actually about, um, it might have been Jamie Nicholson, I think was the main um, one I left off. And I, in hindsight, I probably regret that one. But all the others I was pretty happy with and um, for different reasons. Because you've got to remember, 
and, uh, when you're ranking these the top tens of anything with the boxing, do you go by you know achievements? Do you go by the biggest wins? Do you go by overseas versus home based? Um, you know, do you go by natural talent compared to someone who might be as talented but has achieved more? It's a very very tough 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 thing to do. So it was it was pretty hard, but I was pretty happy with my list. So I'm glad you enjoyed it, mate. Thanks very much for uh, for that. Uh, in your career, who was your hardest fight? And was there any reason you didn't turn pro? Well, I went to the Olympics in 96 and I fought a uh, guy from Kazakhstan. Um, I can't remember his name. Now, he was easily the the best fighter I fought. And um, it was tough because it was, it was really hard, the Olympics, because I was the least experienced on the team. I think I was the youngest or one of the youngest on the team, the least experienced. And I was in on the first day, first session. I didn't really have a chance to really take it all in. And on top of that, I fought the Kazakhstan guy who was a three-time junior world champion coming into the seniors. It was a recipe for disaster. Not to say it would have been any any um, different, but, um, yeah, I learned the hard way that, um, mate. So he was my hardest fight because he was just so so much above uh, the fighters. Look, uh, internationally, I fought um, Leonard, is it Leonard Bundu or Leonardo Bundu, the Italian who fought for world titles. I fought him at the Worlds in '97. Lost by one point to him. I still think I won that fight, by the way. But lost by a point. Um, but also, some of the hardest fights I had was home. That was at home. Richie Riles, who was unlucky to miss out on my top ten, uh, I became really good friends with. Uh, Richie actually dropped me in the '93 Nationals, put me on my ass at the Nationals in Redcliffe. Um, one of the only fighters, or the only fight I've ever been legitimately put on my ass, and he did it. I mean, he knocked a lot of guys out. He didn't knock me out, I will say, but he put me on my ass. It was a piss of a punch. Um, and a very, very good fighter. Richie had a lot of respect for him. But, yeah, a lot of my toughest fights were in Australia, strangely enough, um, because what you sort of find in Australia, the Aussies come to fight no matter what level they're at. And they'll go head to head, and it's on. It's on. A lot of the international fights, it's more of a, you would have heard me refer to it in the other episodes, a bit more of a, a chess match, arm fencing type of thing. So you might get outboxed by a lot of these, lot of these fighters, but you don't, get, you don't get punished. That's why I didn't like amateur boxing, because you're getting outboxed by someone that, you know, you might be stronger than, might be, you know, harder than, might be fitter than, but all they do is they arm fence for three rounds and they score enough points and they win. That was the very frustrating thing about being an amateur boxer. So my hardest fights, as I said, the guy at the Olympics um, and Richie back in Australia, but yeah, um, I can't sort of name a lot off my head, but the, the hardest, toughest fights I had were Aussie, actually Aussies, if you can uh, imagine that. And the reason I didn't turn pro, mate, I'll be honest with you, I think I've said this on one of the other episodes I've done on, on YouTube, is that I turned pro? Uh, sorry, I turned 25 uh, just before the 98 Commonwealth Games. Um, I had a decision to make. I did have a conversation with Jeff Fennick after the Commonwealth Games. He was after Danny Green. Um, I think there was a couple of um, Island boys he might have been after as well. And he and he spoke to myself about turning pro. Um, but as I just just turned 25, uh, I was about to get married. I wanted to go into business. And in professional boxing, you're either all in or you're all out. And I just did, didn't have it there. And I know this is a funny thing. It's a little bit of my OCD sort of kicking in. But when I was 10 years old, when I first started boxing, I wanted to do a few things. I wanted to go to the Olympic Games. I wanted to go to the Commonwealth Games. I wanted to go to the World Championships. And I wanted to retire when I was 25. And I don't know why, but I achieved all those things. I tick, 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 tick. And for some reason, after Commonwealth Games, the fact that I'd done all that, I hadn't got the results I was after, I will say, but I ticked the boxes as far as getting to where I wanted to get to. And I just turned 25. And just like that, it was, I'd lost the fire. And, um, you know, as I said, I was getting married, couldn't wait. I was getting, I think I got married a couple of months after I got home and I went into business a couple of months after that. I never really looked back. Um, do, I, do I regret it? I've been asked a lot of times. Um, yes and no. I don't regret turning pro because my heart wasn't in it. And, um, you know, I just had a lot of bigger fish to fry in the business world after that. So I was totally focused on that. But on the other hand, I've seen a lot of boxers that I've fought in the amateurs and beat in the amateurs or sparred with and handled no problems. Uh, or even guys at different weights that I knew that I was on a par with um, fight and win world titles. Um, not, not that there's any guarantee you get that's going to happen to me, of course. But when I look at that, and I say, yeah, could that have been me or what? Well. But on the other hand, look, I got married. I'm still married after all these years, uh, 24 years, coming up to 20, uh, coming up to 24 years. Uh, been in business for 23 years and been successful in that. So I don't regret it that way. But it's pretty hard to put out the fire when um, 
when you're, you've been boxing since you've been 10 years old. And lucky I was able to fill that void of the competitive um, competitive spirit and the fire that you need boxing. I was able to fill that with putting all that in the business. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of boxers don't have that privilege or footy players, whatever it might be, and they fall on hard times because they don't have that. I was very lucky I had something to fill the void. But that's why I didn't turn pro, mate, because, as I said, you're either 100% or you're at 0%. And I was, might have been 80%, which is nowhere near enough to commit yourself to a professional career. And um, and that's that's what happened. Uh, what have we got there? Next, uh, Rua repeatedly punching you in the nose. <laughs> Would have been pretty tough, wouldn't it? It was actually it was Tua. Um, it was Alex Tua, the brother of David Tua. Um, that was a bit rough, I will say, mate. I uh, fought him in the 96 Olympic trials. I fought him um, on Fox. It's on YouTube if you want to check it out. And even though I had the protector on, the, the you know, the groin protector, that hurt. Because if you look at it, it hit me about six times, fair and squarely in the nether regions, and they were hurting. Normally, if you get a hit down there, um, it doesn't hurt because you got the protector on. He was hitting me at an angle, though, that it was just, you know, it was pushing up. I don't want to get too graphic about it, but they, they were hard. And, um, yeah, it was no problem continuing, but he got disqualified. I think he had three or four warnings and had disqualified. Not, not probably the way to win the gold medal at the Oceania Games, I will say. But, um, yeah, um, it was pretty tough, mate. I had a bit of a squeaky voice for a couple of days, but because uh, normally you see fighters get hit down there and they, they play it up and roll around on the ground and like they've been shot. Those shots don't necessarily hurt a lot. But if you look at this one, it was probably, as I said, three, four, five really good hard shots right down there. And yeah, it was uh, tough. But I'm glad you've watched that fight actually, uh, mate. So I uh, appreciate that. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. Uh, what have we got here? People throw you... I'm not sure what that means, mate. D K S A B and duck cards out too often. Many want to be know it alls, and social media made them forget common courtesy social skills. Yeah, you're right, mate. We all tend to um, hide behind the keyboards, don't we? We're all experts and all that sort of stuff. Can you just put in there what the D K S A B means, mate? Even if you put it in the comments, I won't put it on the screen if, if it's a bit rude, but um, I'll put it on there anyway. I don't care. I'm not quite sure what that means, but. Um, yeah, many a wannabe know it or so many of them out there, guys. And look, I tend to laugh about it these days. And my, my, my philosophy with the whole thing is, is don't don't put yourself out there with these shows or put things on social media if you're not if you're not capable of wearing the bit of criticism. Now, when I first started this, I must admit I was taken back a little bit by um, oh, thanks, Tara. That's my wife. Don't know shit about boxing. Well, there you go. I didn't even pick that up. Thanks, Tara. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, so I forgot, lost my train of thought there. Uh, appreciate your takes in, and yeah, thanks, mate. Appreciate that. But yeah, a lot of lot of know it alls out there. Oh, that's what I was saying. Yeah, so when I put out there, I must admit, when I first started getting some some criticism on social media about maybe it's a pick of a dream fight, maybe it's opinion of an upcoming fight, maybe it's a review of a fight. I don't know, whatever it might be. Maybe people just think I'm a wanker. I don't know. But a lot of a lot of comments um, sort of thrown out there. And uh, at the start, I must admit, I was taken aback a little bit, and but I thought, oh well, you got to you got to harden up, and and take a little, little bit of criticism. Um, but one thing I will do, if, if I will comment back, if it's a legitimate bit of criticism or someone just being a dick, I got no dramas commenting back and you know having a bit of a to and fro about it. Doesn't doesn't sort of stress me at all. But um, I'm always up for criticism. Cr- constructive criticism if you want to disagree with me no problem i'm not going to you know have an argument about it i'll respectfully disagree and vice versa but these ones that get out there and just this whole thing you don't know shit about boxing bullshit well you know especially when, when you do the top tens and that sort of stuff well it's, it mightn't be i don't know shit about boxing it might be um the fact that i just have a a, a different opinion oh it's paul <laughs> Paul Woolley. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Uh, that was Paul about the uh, getting punched in the nuts. So sorry, mate. I didn't um, I didn't know it was yours. That's an interesting um, side in you got there, mate. So, but yeah, so look at the day, as I said, um, it is what it is. And, um, but yeah, if you, if you want to make a comment, um, be prepared for me to come back at you because I'm not going to just take it and ignore it. So, um, but anyway, but I really appreciate it too, mate. Um, it's just my opinion again. This is why we talk boxing. You guys bring up the topics. I'm just giving my my opinion. If you guys want to come back at me, then uh, 
then uh, let me have it. I'm just going to check to make sure I haven't um, lost any comments here. Uh, where are we? Check out Shane Carlin. This is from Paul Haraba. Check out Shane Carlin versus Brock Shelley this Saturday on the Armatruda card. Okay, I'm going to get to the box rec soon. Late starter, but who uh, having a look at? Let me know your thoughts when you see him fight. All right, so I must admit I haven't seen Shane Carlin or Brock Shelley on there. On the schedule, I will go quickly jump ahead to that. That is on this weekend. All right, so what is it there? We have is it on, oh yeah, Shane Carlin is 0-1 against Brock Shelley, 0-1. What am I looking at there, Paul? Are they am I missing something here? They're both zero and one. Is it are they both big punches or whatever it might be? I'm assuming neither one of them got to a great start in their career. So tell me what I'm missing there, mate. Put it in the comments and uh um I will comment back, but I'm not sure who that is on that card. So we'll go over that while we're going, guys. So Susie Ramadan makes her comeback this weekend. This is the Melbourne Pavilion, the big time boxing card, uh, Brian Amatruda. So Susie's fighting Tomoko Okuda uh, over 8 2. Susie's been out of the ring for quite some time. So a comeback fight for her. That'll be good. Uh, a fair few TBAs on there Camille Bala, TBA. Lucas Miller's on there against Chris Vandenese. That should be an okay fight. Khalid Baker with the TBA. Mason Smith um, coming back after that horrific Nikita Zhu knockout, coming up against Jaden Riddle. Theo Dunius, 3 0 against Manyang Dutt, who's 3 1. Walid Hadara with a TBA. Muhammad Jalil with a TBA. Nazir Hadara against Comgrit Nana Korn. I've got a feeling uh, Nana Korn being 3 29 might be the B side. I don't know who you guys are thinking, but I'm thinking that 3 29, he's the B side. Uh, Lewis Mumford with a TBA, TL Muck against Ong Khan Sawang Kalwatan, who's 0 and 2. So, again, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much thinking I've got to remind who's going to win these fights. Ka Lu against Getty Pong Kum Sawat, who's 7 and 10. I've got a feeling there might have been some cheap airfares from Thailand looking at this card. Daniel Roberts, 3 0 against Vakayan Kaman, who's 11 and 34. I think we've got a bit of a problem filling cards at the moment, guys. I don't know what you guys think. Shane, there's the Shane Carlin, Brock Shelley fight. Ben Cameron hands 2-0 and against Ziyi Lee, who's making his debut. So if I was going to that card, I'd probably get there late to watch Susie Ruman. And I think I'm not quite sure those early fights are going to really uh, go too long. So I get there. I've done, I think I'd get there early if I was going to um, watch those earlier fights. If I was you guys. All right, uh, Shane, on the groin guard, I guess the groin, the guard pressure is the bladder, in the bladder is the killer for me. Yeah, because well, what can happen is they can sort of move around a little bit. If they're in the right spot, if you get hit with a good shot, you don't really feel it. If it's coming straight on, if you get the ones that sort of come up from the floor, that's where it can really dig in. And unfortunately, if it's in the wrong spot, it can crush, crush some, um, some bits down there. Um, again, I don't want to get too graphic about it, but they can hurt if it's in the wrong spot, or like I said, in the bladder. So it can, it can hurt. Most of the time, it doesn't hurt because, as I said, it hits the the guard, and they'll roll around on the ground and pretend they hurt to try and get a point taken off. But unless it's coming from the floor, it's not too bad. But um, I have actually seen the fun, one of the funniest things I've seen um, in regard to that was a guy got up and he didn't have the protector on. Now, if you've seen the the been a fighter or you've seen, especially the amateurs, they'll walk up, they'll check your mouth guard and they'll flick you downstairs to make sure you got it on. This guy didn't have a protector on and ping, and um, he did more damage than what the uh, <laughs> the opponent was going to. I think it was pretty funny. And then I had to get out of the ring and go put one on and then come back in the ring. So anyway, uh, another comment here we got there. Really appreciate this. Zig, Mike, I'm not sure whether you've commented before, but really great to have you along, mate. Uh, thanks for answering our questions. What's your thoughts on boxes switch hitting? See a lot more of it these days. Is it a bad idea? Is it a good idea to have that up your sleeve? My opinion, uh, Zygmunt, I don't like it at long range. I don't mind it at close range. Now, I'll explain why. I don't like it at long range because, let's face it, if you're the average fighter, and um, most of us are, if you're, say, an orthodox and you're fighting at long range, that you're fighting at your 100% capacity you're an orthodox fighter so you're fighting at 100 because you're at you're at you know you're fighting an orthodox stance the second you turn south ball from long range you're reducing your c capacity from 100 percent back to probably 70 percent or even less could even be 50 percent depends on how much you've actually done so you're actually um handicapping yourself by switching 
if that makes sense. So an orthodox at 100%, you're, um, you're 100% of your capabilities, you switch, you reduce your your um, your capacity by at least 25, 30%, sometimes even more. So that's a long range. So that really opens you up to being carved up from long range if someone knows, knows what they're doing. In close, I haven't got a problem with it if it's used in the right way. Now, I like it when you're in close to give yourself more room. They might be crowding you. You might be on, on the ropes. They might be holding you. Um, or whatever it might be. Actually, I'm again thinking if you're an orthodox fighter here, to step back with that left foot to, to be in the orthodox, uh, sorry, to be in the, the southpaw stance and then be able to rip an hook or an uppercut or whatever it might be to give yourself a bit of that little bit of room. That's the way to do it. So to answer your question, no, I'm not a fan of it. I strongly discourage kids from doing it and novices from doing it especially novices. If, novices, it's an easy way of getting yourself knocked out. Kids can maybe get away a, a little bit because they've got that natural talent. And even if they muck it up, they're not going to really get hit that hard by other kids. So there might be a learning experience. But I, I think kids should practice it a lot in the gym. I've got no problems with that. Um, but don't really put in the practice in a fight until you know, you've know you had a lot of fights under your belt and you're very, very comfortable with it. Or more importantly, your trainer's comfortable with it. So yeah, I'm not a fan of that at all, to be, to be honest, mate. I... Um, I myself used to do it, as I said, in close, but from long range, I don't know why they do it. Look, unless you hurt your hand or whatever it might be, that's probably a different story. Um, but, yeah, I don't I don't like it. Uh, oh, okay, I like that, Steve. I'll get to that in a sec. Um, but, yeah, so bad idea or good idea. Look, it's a great idea to have it up your sleeve if you're good at it, but I must admit I haven't seen... I'm trying to think of uh, any fighter that I've ever seen. Actually, Marvin Hagler. And this is a pro, of course, one of the greatest fighters of all time. I'm trying to think of amateur or pro, advanced, novice, kid, whatever it might be, who's actually been as effective as a southpaw as they are at orthodox, especially from long range. I don't think I have. Hagler's probably the only one I can think of who I would say fought just as well as as a southpaw as he what he did, did as an orthodox fighter. So... I might be wrong. Put it in there if you think can, uh, can think of someone else, but I don't think Hagler. And this is of all time. I, I really can't. And uh, I just don't know why you would handicap yourself by getting some bright idea in your head that hey, let's turn Southpaw for thirty seconds and see what happens. <laughs> I can tell you what happened. If I if I was fighting someone that switched, I would I would put the heat on. I would hey, right. I would start you know making the work because they're at a disadvantage. They've gone from 100 percent to seventy percent. To pick a number so put the heat on them make them fight put them on the back foot You're, you've got the advantage with them so um you know that that's my opinion what else have we got there all right i want to put this one out there i really like this comment it's from and thanks Stephen. he was the best at it this is Hagler i'm talking about skinny uh crawford he could turn southbourne and orthox could he okay um yeah i don't remember seeing him actually turn um, Southpaw that much, but uh, you'd know better than what I would. But uh, yeah, Hag was the only one I can think of that when he turned Southpaw or Orthodox, he was just effective as one than the other. All right, I like this one here. Uh, where is it? It was from Stephen, I think, was it? Uh, hang on. Where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Hang on, I'll go back one here, guys. Sorry. All right, uh, here's one. For for you another time to think the top 10 trainers of all time wow very very good uh selection there mate i like that um yeah i'd really like to hear well to think about this is i'm, I'm assuming um i'll get that off there i'm assuming that you guys that you're talking about um you know, professional trainers or amateur trainers i'm not sure there's a lot of them around is it amateurs in australia or or the uh, the world, it's a little bit hard to do because actually probably it's probably it's not okay. Let's I'll, I'll see if we can do that. The top ten trainers of all time. I don't want to upset any of the trainers out there, but I will put that out there. All right, another one here. Uh, it's good if they know when they when they should switch, but if they're doing it for show, sometimes they they <laughs> baffle with bullshit. That's what I said, mate. Sometimes all they do is just confuse themselves. They'll turn again. I'm, I'm thinking of an orthodox fighter. They'll turn pro, and they look lost because they've probably seen someone else do it or practiced it a few times in in the gym and think, "Geez, it works in sparring or it works on in, on the pads." And wonder why they're getting snapped down the middle with a straight right hand because they're just not used to it. And as I said before, all they're doing is handicapping themselves. I don't I don't like it. 
except if you're in close, totally different ball game. But from long range, definitely not. If there's some trainers out there, a box out there or who disagree, no problem. But for me, um, I'm saying no to the switching um, stances, especially from long uh, from long range. Um, what have we got here? Do you think switch hitting really worries opponents? No, absolutely not. It doesn't. As I said before, if someone did it to me, right, time to put the pressure on. Let's go. Because they actually disadvantage themselves. You don't have to do it for them. They put themselves in that position. So, and most of the time, as I said, they'll go back and, and they don't really know how to do it properly. So, especially if they go from orthodox and switch to southpaw, it's just that right hand straight down the middle every day of the week. Or um, or attack them from outside the, the lead hand, the right hand. Because they, like, they've got nothing else. They don't really know how to hook with it. If they do hook with it, it's not powerful or anything. So, just my opinion. But again, in close. Step back. Give yourself room. And then use it as your, uh, you know, as an advantage to you. Um, what do we got yet? Stephen says, what do we got there? Worldwide trainers. Okay. I'm just, excuse me here, guys, too. Because for some reason, the ones on one of the pages doesn't come up on the feed. So, we've got to keep checking the feed. Keep the, the questions coming, but I don't see them. Um, no such thing as the best trainer. Just got to gel with your fighter. Thanks, uh, Skinny. Uh, look at Jeff Horn and Russian. I was probably looking for a little bit of a bit of help there, Skinny, so I really appreciate that, man. What he's saying is that sometimes you don't have to necessarily be the best trainer, but you've got to gel with your fighter the most. And what he's using here is a perfect example. Jeff Horn and Glenn Rushton. Now, I get along really well with, with Glenn. Good guy. I wouldn't call him one of the best trainers in Australia, let alone the world. And I'm not trying to insult Glenn. I'm just calling it as I see it. Uh, he hasn't really had that boxing, boxing background. I think he's more of a karate or, or whatever it might be, martial arts type of trainer. But, geez, what a job he did with Jeff Horn. Now, people have made fun of him, the way he holds pads and the way he does everything. But it worked. It worked for Jeff Horn. And um, you can't argue with it. You cannot argue. And his brother, Ben, we all saw what he did against Nikita Zoo. So I've got a lot of time for Glenn Rushton because of, of what he did for the Horn brothers, especially Jeff. So 100% agree with you, Skinny. I think if you get that right um, gel with the coach and you get that perfect chemistry, then anything's possible. And, and look, Freddie Roach, when you think about it, I mean, he's had Manny Pacquiao, and I know he's worked with a lot of great fighters in the past, but has he had a long, steady stream of one champion after another? Probably not. He's worked with some fighters. A lot of them have come from other trainers. Uh, but is he one of the greatest of all time? Well, I suppose history will say yes. I like a trainer, I must admit, now that we're sort of talking about it, I'm a big fan of Robert Garcia. I like the way, no matter what trainer he, uh, what fighter he he works with or trains, they're all very, very good, well structured fighters, uh, well drilled. Um, they've got always got good game plans, good techniques. I really like Robert Garcia over a whole, a whole um, you know portfolio of work. So he would definitely be in there. But I mean, we go back to Angelo Dundee and those types of guys. Correct me if I'm wrong, you historians might know a bit more than me, but Anzo Dundee, apart from Muhammad Ali, who I reckon, again, I risked some um, some backlash here, I'm pretty sure just an average trainer might have been able to train Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, they were just naturally gifted fighters. I've just got a feeling that no matter who trained those guys, they're going to be gun fighters and, and multiple world champions. I might be wrong, um, but again, sometimes... You might need an, uh, an Anzo Dundee. He mightn't be one of the greatest trainers of all time outside those guys, but gelled perfectly with those guys. And if you remember the fight um, with Leonard, um, you know, against Hearns when he said, that, you know, you're letting it slip, um, you're letting it slip, son. You know, those little inspirational things. And my definition, while we're going on this, by the way, my definition of, of a good trainer is there's so many different definitions of a, a great trainer. And I look at Freddie Roach as an example. Um, and I've seen him, I've been lucky enough to see him in the gym, being at wildcard. And someone like him, it's not the yelling and yelling and screaming and all the bells and whistles that you get some other trainers with. A lot of it is might just be a whisper in the ear. You know, it might just be a hand gesture. It might just be a facial expression. It might just be when there's no one there to sit your fighter down, if he's having a bad day, a bad trot of it, and being there as a mentor. So there's so many different things that define a great trainer. Um, and I'm not saying you've got to be a gun trainer to be a gun fighter, all that sort of stuff. But there's little intangibles in there that that just make good fighters gel with with different trainers. So I'm I'm with you, Skinny. And thanks for bringing that up, mate. Very very hard to say. Well, that's that's the you know the top ten. You could probably have your opinion of 
a broader top 10, but I'm not really going to rank them from 10 to 1. I'll probably say these are the 10 I think are the best. Make of it what you will. Um, Hagler was my favourite. Didn't have to turn and flow. Well, mate, he just looked, looked everything. Like, he would go from Southport to Orthodox and wouldn't even notice that he switched. That is a great, great fighter. And as I said, he's the only one I can think of. I'm sure there's others, but he's the only one I can think of that just didn't matter whether it's Orthodox or Southport. It just, he was just a brilliant fighter in either stance and could do it in close or from, from distance. It didn't matter. Um, you know, that, that's a great fighter. Uh, Bud, yes, is currently best. Yep, yeah, good point. Yep, yeah, switch switch hitter. Yes, Bud is. Um, keep him coming, guys. I, I'm just trying to think of any that I can think of at the moment off the top there, but Bud is, is definitely a – is he as good as Hagler? No, but not many are. So, yeah, good point there, mate. I like that. Great trainers uh, commonly operate a very calm corner. Yes. Now, the other thing you've got to consider um, is – and I'll get these other comments in a second – well, the other thing you've got to consider is I, I, I like a calm corner. Now, does that work for everyone? No. But does it work for certain fighters? Absolutely, yes. Now, I think it depends on the fighter. Now, I think sometimes you'll get fighters who need the G up. They need to be slapped across the face or whatever it might be or to really get up. They, they respond well. I must admit I didn't respond well to that at all. I like things to be calm because then you get other trainers who are very calm. Because you look at even even the the really great fighters you know, of, of common uh, of you know, um, uh, modern day. You've got someone like a, a Floyd Mayweather Senior who liked to you know like to have a bit to say. We all know about Teddy Atlas, of course. But then you get a Freddie Roach who's very to the point. Robert Garcia is to the point. Um, another one very much to the point and very calm, collected, and just says what he needs to be said. Because you got to remember these guys. Are almost second fathers to the fighters. They spend so much time with them. They know them inside and out. They're like, um, you know, as I said, fathers or brothers, whatever you might want to say. So they know these guys better than anyone, apart from maybe their partners or wives, or whatever it might be. So that real connection sometimes is they don't need to yell and scream. They can just say what needs to be said. But on the other hand, you do get fighters that do need it. I, I must admit, I wasn't wasn't one of those guys. Uh, get to a couple of comments off the, the main feed here. Um, top 10 trainers, nice one. Yep, thanks, Paul. I like Garcia as well. Boot a lot of his guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you uh, agree with that. Hussey, uh, sorry, not Hussey, it's Nadal. Sorry, Skinny. Uh, all the best to you, mate. And we did have Hussey in my top 10 amateurs of all time. I'm not sure whether you've seen that, mate. Um, but yeah, I like the ones that just continually roll out just good, well rounded fighters. And no matter. Look, if you look across the ring and you see Robert Garcia fighter, you know exactly what you're going to get. As I said, well-drilled, uh, well-schooled, um, fit, hard, made the weight, no problem, and you know what you're going to get. Some of these other trainers, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can say the same thing. So, um, all right, so Stephen says he's talking about trainers like Emmanuel Stewart, Ambrose Palmer, Ernie McQuinn, McQuillan. Uh, yep, yeah, I know what you're talking about there, mate. So uh, maybe we might put a poll up and let you guys vote who you guys um, think. But um, – Skinny's brother goes all right. Yes, as a, yes, and Skinny himself does as well. So um, one of the best in the business, or the whole team at Body Punch. Uh, I don't actually. Sorry, Skinny. I'm not sure whether you're at Body Punch. I think, but uh, the whole Hussein family, great fighters, great trainers, um, and again, they roll out some some very very good fighters as well. So, and it's great to have you watching, uh, Skinny. Um, what have we got here? It's quite possible AJ AJ picked Robert Garcia for Usyk rematch because they gelled together, or it's gelled better. Yeah, that's that's for me. That's a real odd match. I will say when I first saw it announced, I must have been. I was like, I'm not quite sure to make to make um or what to make of this Garcia and Usyk because because Garcia tends to stick to the Latino fighters, and I'm assuming that's because he probably relates to them better. Maybe a lot of them go to him because they like to sort of keep it uh, in-house, I suppose. But the uh, AJ is, a, is a, in, an interesting one. Obviously, they've, they've chosen him for a reason. So, um, you know, I think it's it remains to be seen. Of course, that fight's on uh, is it this weekend, this weekend coming. So I can't wait to see it. But, yeah, it was an odd match for me. It looked a little bit of the odd couple. But, as I said, obviously, they know, know something that we don't. Uh, Virgil Hunter's another one here. Yep. Uh, always enjoyed watching Virgil Hunter and Andre Ward, Ward together. Yeah, spot on, mate. And, and Virgil Hunter's another one. I think he said time with uh, Mia Khan. Um, who else did he have? Did he have? Um, he had Andre Ward, of course. Just trying to think. 
He's had a lot. He had a lot of good fighters at the one time, anyway. Uh, yeah, what have we got there? Yeah, thanks, um, Skinny. Yeah, no, nah, and there's so many of them. Out there. It's, it's pretty hard to sort of on the spot here. I probably have to just, um, go through it in my head. And uh, but we we might definitely talk about that. I think I'll just. But as I said, it's going to be very hard just to rank them from ten to one. I'll just go by ten. It's almost gut feel of who's the best because there's so many different things. As I said that constitute a really good trainer so um anyway we'll keep that in mind so keep the comments coming um does seem i'd match and jelly seem jelling seems like the possible reason well that's the only reason i can think of um because look maybe robert garcia saw it as a bit of a challenge to get away from the latino fighters and take on that big six foot six or whatever he is big heavyweight um yeah, so I suppose the proof will be in the pudding this week. I think we'll get a better uh, AJ. I think that's one thing we can definitely all agree on. We will get a better AJ than what we saw in the last fight. Whether he wins it or not, it's a different story. But the fact that he's got Garcia, I've got no doubt he will be a better fighter. Whether that's enough, I'm not quite sure. I've got an opinion, and my opinion is that Usyk will get the job done again. I do hope, I will say, I really love Usyk as a fighter. I do hope that AJ gets the job done. That's purely and solely to set up the Tyson Fury fight. Um, and that's the only reason. I'm not um, – if you looked at him without that, I would probably say I'd, I'd like Usyk to win again because he's such a great fighter. And, um, you know, I think he did such a good job in the first fight. But uh, for that purely selfish reason reason of wanting to see the Fury fight, I hope AJ gets gets the job done. I think it's on DAZN on Sunday morning, I'm assuming. I'm assuming it's um, if you've got the zone up, it's not a pay-per-view. I would think that it's going to be for well, for free if you're paying your 15 bucks a month, but we'll see. Uh, on to some other news, guys. Uh, again, keep the comments coming there. Um, Chris Eubank, Connor Ben uh, are fighting, uh, what was it? Is it October or November? I think it might be. Who do you think might have that one? The other one, really tragic, this one, David Lemieux. Uh, I don't know you saw it. His dad got got murdered by some guy went on a rampage in Canada and killed his dad, um, which is a real shame. It just that's, a, that's how quick it can happen. And David Lemieux called time on his career, real real shame. I think it would have been time for his career anyway because he he got um, he got he got hurt badly against uh, David Benavides in his last fight. So I think um, that was a good call. Uh, um, so yeah, so good call there. Uh, um, so yeah, all the best to David Lemieux. He, he could punch back in the day for sure, but yeah, a shocking way to, to go out. The other one is, uh, I don't know if you saw this Tevin Farmer, Mickey Bay for the second time has been cancelled at the last minute. This was literally the last minute. So they weighed in, they got to the fight night. Uh, I think the, 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 um, the main support was cancelled. And then obviously the, the, uh, the main event itself was cancelled literally just before they fought. Now, apparently there was a promoter's discrepancy or something they didn't do what they were supposed to with the promoter so how would you be paying for that one you get to the fights and the main support and the main event are both cancelled at the last minute so yeah really really odd so i think the odds are that what that fight doesn't happen again uh adrian broner fights this week against omar figueroa again that's that's a bit of a danny garcia or a t female lopez fight just to get him back uh in the mix i would think so good on uh broner coming back super talented Really wasted a lot of his career, I will say. He could have been such a great fighter. Um, but, yeah, hopefully this this gets him back. And there's probably some other good fights out there for him. But it's a bit of a shame to see him um, end up the way he has, I think, Broner. So we'll see what he comes back with. Canelo and Triple G3, as I said, is next month. We're three and a half weeks away. So I can't wait for that one. And this is one I really, really like seeing last week because one, Estrada, against Chaka Latito Gonzalez. That's going to be in December. So I really uh, can't wait to see that fight as well. So i um, looking forward to that one. Uh, guys, I'm going to have to go over these five fights pretty quickly. I might go, I'll, I'll let them know who, who they are and then we'll go over them a little bit more next week. But um, while you guys are tuning in, we'll, we'll keep the show going because it's great to have you guys along for the uh, for the ride. Um, Paul Haraba. Um that coach who took over from a local trainer in Warrnambool. I think he almost caused an upset with his fighter against a Tassie fighter on one of your cards. I reckon he's not a bad trainer. That was actually um, good at that tournament. Now, that was War in the Bull 2, uh, Paul's talking about there. Now, Paul actually took on uh, Nato McLean down there at, at the last minute. Didn't really spend any time with him. He took on, um, who was it? Uh, 
the big fella. Who was it, Paul? Comment in there. Um, Plugger. Plugger Joseph from Tassie came down from um, from Tasmania and fought on the card. Got in the last minute, almost caused the upset. Bloodied uh, Plugger's nose and almost had him out of there. Lost a split decision, I think it was. It was a ripper fight. Uh, I've got a feeling, though, Paul, there's not going to be a war on the ball three from what I'm hearing down there. So um, we'll leave it at that, eh? But I think that's as far as we're going to go for that. Yeah, Plugger. Thanks, mate. And I hope you're well down there, Paul. Glad to see you're in the uh, in the, the industry at the moment. Uh, what have we got there? So we'll keep the comments going. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. So let's keep it going, guys, with the top five fights. So this, um, now when I'm judging these fights, this is not the five greatest fights of all time. It's simply my favorite fights of all time. And, and some of them aren't necessarily bang, you know, one knockdown, two knockdown wars. And they're not what I think are the five greatest fights of all time. They're my five favorite fights. Uh, favorite favorite fights of all time. So I'm going to put that out there before people come back and say, that's not one of the greatest fights of all time. It's just purely my favorite fights. These, these are in no particular order, by the way, because I couldn't rank them. They're too hard. And I've got my own different reasons for them. Um, let me know what you guys think. I've got number five here again, no particular order. Jeff Harding, Dennis Andrews, one of my top five favorite fights of all time. If you aren't familiar with it, if you're not familiar with it, well, you know, um, you don't know shit about boxing. Shouldn't be a boxing fan, especially if you're an Aussie fan, of course. But Jeff Harding, 1989, took the fight on short notice, took on Dennis Andrews, who was a big punching Brit based at the Detroit uh, Cronk Gym with Emmanuel Stewart. Took the fight. I think he'd only had 12, 13, 14 fights we've ever been. Hadn't fought anyone remotely resembling probably a real world-class fighter. And uh, took the fight, again, as I said, on... Um, on short notice, and um, yeah, got the job done in the twelfth twelfth round, a la Rocky style. Was so far behind the points, it was it was not funny. Probably lost ten of the eleven rounds, or what it was. Come home, um, scored the knockout in the final round, and I think all of Australia was jumping around on the couch um, in the lounge rooms after that fight. Skinny, if you're still on, we've got a comment here. Any news on Willis? So if you can comment on that, if you're still watching, yeah, any news on uh, Willis Meehan, I'm probably assuming. So any news you got on that would be appreciated, mate. Uh, just put it in there. I'll keep looking out uh, to look at that. Yep, Jeff comeback was amazing. Um, again, this is just my favourite favorite fight. So I could watch this any time um, that they're on. Number four, um, I've got Vinny Pazienza, Greg Haugen, number one. Now, if you haven't seen this fight, get on YouTube and watch it. They fought three times. The ultimate grudge fight. You, you, you probably know by now if you watch this, um, this series um, that I love Vinny Pazienza. He's my second favorite fighter of all time behind Jeff Fennick. But I remember back in 1987, this was in Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island. He fought Greg Haugen, the ultimate bad boy, come to his hometown, defended his IBF lightweight title. Very, very spiteful fight. But for 15 rounds, they beat the absolute shit out of each other. Could have went either way. Vinny Pazienza, uh, Pazienza won a split decision. Uh, actually, it might have been unanimous, but it was close. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was unanimous, but a close one. And they just went to war. And uh, then they went for uh, went to fight two times after this. I think um, and Greg Haugen won the next two. Uh, no, Greg Haugen won the second. And Vinny Pazienza won the, won the third. Now, check it out on YouTube. Vinny Pazienza, Greg Haugen won back in 1987 for the IBF lightweight title. Number three is Roberto Duran and Iran Barkley. I love this fight. Now, I know a lot of you guys probably think Duran Barkley. Jeez, wouldn't you think it's Duran uh, Leonard or De Jesus or Hagler? No, for me, it's Iran Barkley. And the reason why, this is probably Duran's last hurrah. Um, you know, he fought Davey Moore back in 83. He got knocked out badly in 84 against uh, the hitman, um, Thomas Hearns, in uh, which was another one of my favourite fights for different reasons because of the, the sheer brutality in which um, Hearns destroyed Duran. Um, but for this one, Duran, um, like he was in the Davy Moore fight, a complete underdog, was not supposed to win. Fort Barkley was coming off the third round knockout of Thomas Hearns to win the WBC middleweight title. Um, it was Bark, uh, sorry, it was at the, I think it was the Las Vegas Hilton in 1989. Sold out crowd, all Duran, just psychos there. The atmosphere, just watching it through the TV was awesome. Uh, Duran boxed beautifully. He put um, Barkley down in the 11th round. I thought the, the roof was going to lift off the joint. It was just a, an unbelievable fight. Very, very sentimental, sentimental reasons for Duran, being a big Duran fan. It reminded me a lot of the Davey Moore fight. And uh, so, again, if you haven't seen it, check it out. 
Barkley Duran from um, 1989 for the WBC middleweight title, Las Vegas Hilton. Go and check it out. You won't regret it. Uh, number two, Julio Cesar Chavez, Meldrick Taylor. Um, I like this one again for the for the drama around it. I really felt for Meldrick Taylor. He won the 11 rounds before that. He probably won nine or 10 of those 11 rounds. Um, Chavez, I, I love the fight too because he never gave up. He kept chugging forward. He kept chugging forward all the time. He kept eating punches. Meldrick pretty much boxed his ears off, but he took a lot of punishment in the process. And Chavez has ground him down round by round, punch by punch, exchange by exchange, and got him out of there with 10 seconds to go. Well, officially it was two seconds to go. So, um, yeah, it was just one of those real dramatic fights. Meldrick Taylor was never the same. If you haven't seen a video I put up uh, about a month or so ago, it was at the International Hall of Fame where the referees on the stage, there was about 10 or 12 of them up there talking about this fight. Uh, Richard Steele wasn't on the stage, but all the other referees were up there talking about uh, they knew Richard Steele. They knew the um, you know events surrounding what happened. Apparently, Meldrick Taylor was was vomiting blood afterwards. Um, spent I think a couple of days in hospital and was never the same fighter after this. They all agreed it was the right call. A lot of controversy out there. A lot of people thought it was a shit call. Um, Ten seconds to go on the clock, and the argument is is that. If Richard Steele had have just let them go, um, even though he hadn't responded, he asked him twice, are you okay? He asked him twice. And on the side of the ring was Lou Duva screaming at the referee. Meldrick Taylor got distracted and looked at Meldrick Taylor. Didn't see Meldrick, um, Richard Steele ask him if he was okay the second time. Didn't respond, so Richard Steele called the fight off. Lou Duva went ballistic. Now, the argument, as I said, is that one is at the red light flushing behind Meldrick Taylor in the corner, which showed there was less than 10 seconds to go. Chavez was on the other side of the ring. He would not even been able to reach Meldrick Taylor by the time he said box. So there's so many different things around. This is a perfect storm of controversy and drama and all the red heartbreak. You name it, this fight had it all. And that's why it's my second fight. Was it the greatest fight of all time? No, of course it wasn't. Probably neither one was any others. But again, it had for different reasons, my favorite fight. And the number one fight, my favorite, again, well, it's not number one, it's, Number one of this group. I haven't ranked them in order. It's just an overall five fights. Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns, number one. I think it's got to be on everyone's list as far as their favorite fights go. I mean, it's three rounds of absolute mayhem. First round's probably the greatest round of all time as far as action goes. Um, and two Hall of Fame fighters absolutely going at it. Left nothing in the ring. Again, so full of drama. So that, as I said, not my number one, but the last one of the of the group. So there it is. So that's my five. Jeff Harding, Dennis Andrees, Vinny Pazienza, Greg Haugen, number one, uh, Duran Barkley, number three, Chavez Taylor, and uh, Hagler Hearns uh, round out the top five. So let's hear your fights. I've got one here. Uh, and this was very tempted to put on there, I must say, mate. Um, Gaddy Ward won. I think that's got to be in most people's top five. That's probably, you know, that's probably an obvious one. But for, for, for different reasons and other fights, mean a little bit more to me than than Gunny Ward. I mean, and all three fights could have been in there, of course. Unbelievable fights. And, of course, you got Raul Marquez and um, uh, who did he fight? Uh, Vasquez was another one. They fought, I think, four times. Uh, so many fights you could have had in there. But um, Hagler Hearns, yeah, definitely up there. Hagler Hearns, um, appreciate that, mate. That's the same. Yeah, all four Kings fights up there. Yeah, well, you're right. You could have all those fights. I mean, you could put in Duran, Leonard. Um, as I said, I'll put in Duran Hearns it was an asterisk beside it because I love the pure power and absolute demolition that Her uh, that Hearns put on Duran. It's my favorite fight for the pure master mastery of the whole thing. The art, the art he put in of knocking such a living legend like Duran out um, in two rounds, mind you, put him down uh, twice, and the second round. Now, that second knockdown in the second round, you had to see it to believe it. So I'm assuming everyone's seen that fight. If you haven't, um, log on to that one as well. So so let us know what you guys think um, of that one, guys. I, um, you know, I just think they're th five of the greatest fights of all time, or my favourite fights of all time. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear yours, so let them go. Next week, I'm going to revisit my Australian top 10 of all time. This is my the pros I'm talking about here. We did the amateurs a couple of weeks ago. We did it in the first ever episode. 
about 12 months ago. We've done about 300 different shows since then. Um, but uh, I'll just check a comment there. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go. Yeah, you too, um, Paul. Thanks, mate. Leonard Hearns, 89. Uh, yeah, the second fight. Good call. I didn't actually mention that one. That was probably that was better than the first fight. The first one probably had a little bit more drama with Hearns coming back and, and – uh, sorry, Leonard coming back and Hearns being in front and all the rest of it. But the second fight, I thought – um, Hearns won the fight. It was a draw. He knocked uh, Leonard down twice from memory. They actually um, called it um, the war or the fight or whatever it was. So, yeah, that was that was a ripper. Alexis Argaio, Aaron Pryor, Skinny. I must admit that was almost on there. I love that fight. Again, if you haven't seen it, just get off now and go watch it. Uh, an absolute war for 14 rounds. That was probably number six, I reckon, Skinny, I must say. Almost put it on there. But there's so many different fights. There's so many different reasons for, for having your favourite fights. And as I said, they're not necessarily the most action fights, but just the ones with a little bit of drama or the outcome or whatever it might be um, involved. Uh, for pure passion reasons, what's my name? I'm assuming that's the Ali and who was it that he fought? What's my name? Um, I've gone blank. That was well, Cassius Claypon. Oh, it was when he turned to Ali, of course. Who is... Better let me know there, mate. But yeah, it was um a heavyweight that he kept saying, What's my name during the fight? And he um pretty much beat the shit out of him. I don't think he stopped him. I think he just batted him for 15 rounds, I think it was. I had Tommy in second fight too. Classic, yeah. And I'm gonna this is actually on the list, but giving a little bit away. The the second Leonard Duran, uh sorry, Le Leonard Hag uh Ben, where are we going to now? 36. The second Leonard Hearns fight will be a classic fight on my next selection. This week is – who is the next fight coming up? Um, geez, I've got a mental blank on that as well. The dream fight, though, will be Johnny Famishon and Lionel Rose, so keep a look out for that one. Uh, I've got some more comments on here. Yes, Vargas Trinidad, another ripper. Skinny, thanks, mate. Yep, that's another one you got to watch. Um, all right, so to answer the question, this is um, – for Shane, this is you. You ask Skinny a question. Uh, he said he's got a hand injury. This is Willis Mann, uh, assuming it was, yeah, was the response. So he's got a hand injury, mate. So I'm sure he'll be back. Wouldn't you love to see him against uh, Justice Hoonie at some stage or Dempsey McKean or one of those guys? If I was those, those, uh, the teams managing those guys, I would keep him right away from Willis Mann. I would love to see it as a fan, but geez, that's a tough, tough fight for McKean or Hoonie. Um, or a Lucas Brown or one of those guys. So, uh, yeah, all the best with his injury there, Skinny, because um, very, very good uh, prospect is Willis Mean, and the guy is a is a big, big man. He can punch and can do some damage if, uh, if given the opportunity. So, so yeah, so as I said, guys, getting back to the Leonard Hearns two fight, that will be the next classic fight that I – that, um, that I do. So geez, I can't remember who is it that's next. Michael Tamura was the one who, who thought of it. But anyway, so that's my favourite fights, guys. As I said, next week will be the top the top 10. I'm going to revisit my top 10 pro fighters of all time. Uh, and then I might do the top 10 world fighters after that. Well, we'll just keep them coming because the opinions always change. Lester Alice, Jeff Fennick would have been the dream fight. Well, mate, we have actually done that dream fight. That was one of my early dream fights that we did. So that was – and that's probably uh, one of the top Aussie fights. That was another thing I'm going to do too, um, the top five Aussie fights that never happened. So I want your suggestions on that as well, the top five Aussie fights that should have happened but didn't. And the dream fight coming up, of course, is uh, Johnny Famishon and Lionel Rose. But, yeah, I did have Lester Ellis and Jeff Fennick um, as uh, the – one of the earlier dream fights that we did. So check that out. There's a lot on there on the dream fights. I think we did the other Aussie ones were Troy Waters, Tim Zhu. We did Barry Michael, George Cambosis, some of the Aussie fights. But um, yeah, so we, we, we'll do that one. Uh, yeah, Willis to following Carly's footsteps. Yeah, well, he's got good pedigree, hasn't he there, mate? Um, look, the only issue we're going to have with Willis Meehan is that he's going to struggle to get people to fight him. He's just that, that type of guy. Why would you fight him if you don't have to? Um, because I, I think I think I would definitely back him to beat Dempsey Mean, I will say. Not the Huni fight might be a bit different story. Um, because I've got a lot of time for Huni, but that would be a rip of a fight. Maybe Joseph Goodall might be another another option for him out there. But um we'll see. Uh da -da -da. I was caught a draw, but Hearns won it. Lennon says that. Yeah, well, yeah, on that 
Stephen just said with the Leonard Hearns 2 fight, um, that even if you looked, I think it was even recently, Leonard's actually said that he thought Hearns won that that second fight. So, And I, I really felt for for Thomas Hearns in that fight because at the end of the day, he, um, I, I don't think he was the same fighter after that either, even though he was probably getting on a year, in years as well, of course. But that would have been his crowning moment as far as his legacy goes. Um, and I really felt bad for him because he never got that, apart from Duran, I suppose, he never got that that win over Hagler or Leonard, which I think he, you know, he really w- would have really um, deserved. But, you know, just to, to really cement his spot, you know, in, in the, the order of the, of the Kings. Uh, every, uh, very hard to match him these days. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's Skinny saying very, very hard to, to match. So Willis, uh, Willis Meehan, I would love, look, you guys, um, Skinny, you obviously – um, steer his career. I'd love to see him with a no limit or a DNL where they can get behind him and really put the dollars into him. I, I, you've seen other fighters. Um, Dennis Hogan um, signed, I think it was a three fight deal with no limit. Now he's got himself a world title. Jade Mitchell's done the same. He's coming back soon as well. He's inked a deal, a three fight deal with them as well. Um, you know, all these guys that are just attaching themselves, not necessarily to be under the umbrella, but just. Um, committing to three, four, five fight deals with the No Limits or DNLs just to try and get that TV exposure and also the money to be able to put in the getting some of these guys over. Because let's face it, Dempsey McKean's with um, Matchroom. There's no way they're going to want him to fight someone like Willis. Um, uh, Lucas, well, Lucas Brown's a bit of a free agent, but he's only in it, he's in it for the coin. So he's not going to look at Willis because high, high risk, very little reward for Lucas in that fight. And then you've got uh, Justice Honey. I doubt very much that Dean L would uh, go anywhere near Willis Mean to fight. Uh, 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 sorry, Justice Honey to fight Willis Mean. So hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully that you know with a bit of a bit of money um, in the boxing scene in Australia at the moment that might be the case. But I'm assuming it was Justice Honey and Willis Mean. That would be some big dollars to make that fight. Um, I would think. And 100% there, Skinny Mike McCallum. So underrated. Um, we've had a couple of fights with him on there as well he's another one yeah that he look he could have been part of that that big you know, the, the the kings i suppose if he had been maybe three four years or five years earlier maybe uh but he i mean he, he beat some great fighters and you got to remember back when he beat even donald curry and mike McC- um uh, milton mccrory both were coming up from welterweight but donald curry had, had the one loss to lloyd huntingham it still was regarded as one of the top 10 pound for pounds mckellar mind him out mccrory lost to curry but was still considered a you know, very uh, legitimate fighter. Destroyed him and all the other fighters. Well, I'm just obviously he beat Jeff Harding, and I'm just sort of throwing a few out there. But very, very underrated fighter. Had the uh, the, the privilege of meeting Mike McCallum at um, it was Mayweather's gym in uh, in Vegas. Could not do enough for us. Such a great guy. And I don't want to be name dropping here. I sound like other people, but uh, I've got a lot of a um, lot of respect for um, for Mike McCallum. Uh, way off topic, but I was actually expecting a much more competitive fight in Green Machine versus Hurricane Briggs. Now that I was almost going to put that fight in the five fights that that um, should have happened but didn't. Now I know they did technically fight, but for me, we all know the the background of the fight. Briggs certainly wasn't prepared for that fight. Um, not, I mean, a lot of conspiracy theories going around about it about whether because I think he wasn't past fit in Sydney or Queensland, so they did it in Perth or whatever it was. Um, obviously, had some issues um, upstairs, and um, I think there's a lot of a lot of things that went wrong with that. I'm not going to comment too much because I'm not quite um, sure of the particulars. All I do know is that fight should not have gone ahead. Uh, I know there's money involved and all the rest of it, but I would have loved to have seen that fight four or five years earlier. That's a fight for me that should have happened. When Briggs was light heavyweight, he was, he was challenging for world titles, and he was just a beast. An absolute beast was Briggs, and that fight with Green. I actually would have beat, tipped him to beat um, Green back when he was at his peak. And I know that's a pretty, pretty much a bold statement, but I just think at the peak, maybe five years earlier, I think Briggs would have beaten um, Danny, Danny Green. So, um, so just my opinion. Oh, sorry, that was Mike McCallum was very um, underrated. That was Andy. Sorry, mate. I, um, I uh, thought someone else said that. Um, so there it is, guys. Um, so. He's, any other topics you'd like to um, to uh, to let me know? I'll definitely touch on. But as I said, I'll do the top ten Aussies um, next week. I'll do the top um, ten of all time. We might even do the top ten heavyweights again of all time. We'll just keep different topics coming. Um, oh, so Skinny just said didn't pass medical in Sydney. This is Briggs. 
So uh, they moved it to Perth. So, look, end of the day, mate, I think everyone agree the fight shouldn't have happened. And, look, I was going to say I do feel for Danny Green, but I've got a suspicion they had an inkling of maybe what was happening, took the fight anyway. Uh, I, I might be wrong again. I won't comment too much because I'm not 100% sure. All I know is he should not have been in the ring. And I did I did feel for Briggs to some extent because, obviously, there was money involved. You probably needed the money. But you could tell that mentally he wasn't there. He had some some um, psychological issues. I think he's actually come out and said that. So it's a little bit of a shame that that, that actually happened. But, um, look, one thing I will say, what's great about Paul Briggs these days, I think it's great. He's back involved in boxing. He's obviously a trainer now. Seems to be on, on really good terms with himself. So that's great because I've got so much respect for him as a fighter. I, I remember, just to get off point, going to see him. I think I was 21 or something. I went to see... Um, Briggs fight in uh, on the Gold Coast. It was when he was a Muay Thai fighter. I've got a feeling I might have been 18 or 19 at the time. Now, he actually got beat by the Thai fighter. This, this Thai fighter kicked him in the legs about 100 times and he just couldn't continue. But I remember just the, the power and the attitude and the grunt that he had. And I remember thinking at the time, gee, this guy could be a pretty good boxer if you put his mind to it. He's only a kid. And, um, and of course, that's what he turned his, his attention to. So, yeah, I think Paul Briggs, um, another very, very underrated fighter. I think he's tarnished a lot by what happened in the green fight. But I just think he was a hell of a fighter and, and could have achieved a lot more. And as I said, I think he would have beaten Mundine, uh, Matt or Mundine. I was going to say green. I think he would have beaten Mundine as well. But anyway, we'll never we'll never know. Uh, I've seen the spa green got better. Well, there you go. Is that philosophy, um, philosophy there? Skinny, thanks, mate. Thanks for blowing out. Well, this is <laughs> – he saw Briggs and Green fight, and Green got the better of it. But, yeah, I don't know. Who, who knows what, what could have happened. But um, still would have been good to see. All right, guys, that's about it for this evening. I really appreciate you guys uh, logging in again. Um, keep the topics coming. Uh, I really liked – of course, we'll go over all the, the latest news, uh, what's going on. But it's good to have a side topic just to throw out there and – and discuss, um, but there's only so many topics I can come up with, so so keep it coming. Not quite sure what the stream was like tonight, guys. Doesn't matter what I do, it seems to be all over the place, so it's going to be what it's going to be. As long as you can hear me, that's the main thing. So, uh, and whether you're listening on Spotify or watching it live or after the after the fact, it's been good. Our views have been going up, which has been which has been great. Um, a lot so after the fact on YouTube and Facebook. But I don't care where you watch the show as long as you're watching. And uh, for all you guys who give up your Monday night, I know there's all the footy shows and all the rest of it that um, that are on on Monday night. Um, you know, again, I appreciate you logging in. You do have plenty of choices, so so I appreciate uh, your attention. And I uh, hope you got a, a little bit out of it. Anything else you might want to talk about, make sure you let me know in the DMs and um, we'll talk about it in the future episodes. But uh, thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you next week.